Hi, how are you? Nice of you to accept our uh, invitation for this webinar to enlighten us on hip preservation. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm sorry. I appreciate you letting me do this um, a little bit later. 5.30 in the morning on a Sunday was going to upset my wife some. I know. I, know. <laughs> I hope we'll get lunch. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we are live, so, gentlemen, we are live on YouTube. So uh, I will just request um, uh, the moderators for the session, Dr. Milan Pimprikar. Sanjay Trivedi will be joining us and Dr. Milan, uh, the, uh, Leonard Pondraj is already here. Leo, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi. So Dr. Leonard Pondraj is our uh, hip arthroscopy surgeon, very, very popular surgeon in India. And we have eminent panelists who will be joining us for the case-based discussion. Dr. Vijay Shetty will be joining us in half an hour. Dr. Prashant Tonpe. Hi, Prashant. Can you hi, hear me? Hi, Roshan. Hi. hi, Roshan. Dr. Subra, he will be joining us. Dr. Raghuvir, Rajiv, Umesh, and Kalpesh. They all will be joining us in some time. So meanwhile, I'll request Dr. Leonard Pondraj and Dr. Atik Vasdev to proceed with the scientific agenda. We have only one speaker, that, that is Dr. Mark Safran. I'll just like to introduce Dr. Mark Safran. He is a, a wonderful surgeon and wonderful researcher. And uh, he's from Stratford University in America. And uh, he has got great work in hip arthroscopy and hip preservation. I've been attending all his lectures in Isakos. Uh, as an eminent speaker, I always follow him. And uh, what impresses me is his way of handling the, uh, the, uh, the uh, technical expertise in hip arthroscopy, especially as a, uh, uh, the eminent speaker. Whenever he has to explain, he'll explain with great zeal. And that what make him a great teacher. So, without any delay, I'll request Dr. Mark Safran uh, to start his presentation and Dr. Leon, Leonard and Dr. Atik was there to moderate the session. I think both of you have the program, Atik. Yeah. You know. yeah. yeah. You can invite Leonard, Dr. why don't you start? Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Safran? Yes. Uh, hi. 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 Uh, hi. Uh, I, I've heard a lot about you and I had a, a short training with uh, Michael Deans in Germany. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I have a bit of uh, experience uh, uh, using the uh, proximal anteromedial portal rather than going to the anterolateral portal. So it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, what, what you would like to say about the indications, portals, and techniques. So we'll let you get on with your first talk, please. Well, thank you. Yeah, Mark, so I, I, just, I'll I, mute I, everyone. I, I'll mute everyone so that there is no disturbance to you and you are unmuted okay mark you can go ahead okay thank you well thank you for the invitation to, to speak and i appreciate again the flexibility on the timing um and so I'm, I'm i was asked to give a few separate talks one on the hip arthroscopy about the indications as well as the anatomy portals and technique and i think uh you'll see actually my technique's a little bit different than michael dean's and actually most of the people in the, in the world seem to be going to using a two portal approach for hip arthroscopy. And I'll explain why I don't go that route, but not if, in the discussion, if you'd like. So hip arthroscopy has had a slow acceptance. And part of this is because there's a lot of neurovascular structures around the hip joint itself. It is technically difficult. I've scoped all the different joints of the body. And I would think that this is probably the hardest uh, joint to scope, uh, partly because it's a more constrained joint it has a very thick soft tissue envelope around it with a dense capsule, which makes it hard to distract the joint as well as hard to maneuver within the joint itself. And the learning curve tends to be very prolonged. It takes a lot of cases, I think, to develop a high level of proficiency and not cause any complications or damage. So before I speak on technique, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what my indications are for hip arthroscopy. And that's based on the symptoms of the patient. And I think the first thing you need to determine because the hip is such a deep joint and a lot of things radiate, is the pain intraarticular or is the pain extraarticular? And for this, and then we'll talk about what can be fixed with arthroscopy. And one of the things I always say is, this is these are the things that I can fix with arthroscopy. There's certainly people that can do more than I, um, but it's important to know what your limitations are in your expertise and experience in being able to do hip arthroscopy. And you start with the simpler procedures and work your way up to the more complex. So the first thing I always like to say, though, is that I can't make somebody better who is asymptomatic. So indication one is they have to be symptomatic. 
And that comes down to when we talk about FAI, ephemeral acetabular impingement, some of the people are concerned that that leads to arthritis. And so you should do surgery to prevent arthritis. And though there's no data that actually suggests that we do that, people always ask me, well, I have, the, I have pain on one side, I, oper I, I operated on the one side, made them better. The other side, they have no symptoms, but they have the anatomy of impingement should they have surgery for it. So my indication number one is that they have to have pain that we know is coming from inside the joint. So we need to determine is the point in, pain inside the joint or is it outside the joint? And people with pain inside the joint, they tend to complain of pain that's deep. They do what's called the C sign um, where they put their thumb and their long finger around their joint and say, it's where my fingers meet in the deep inside the joint. Um, it's oftentimes localized here in this kind of groin region. When I ask my patients, you know, where does it hurt? And I ask them if it hurts in the groin, they don't necessarily think that that's the groin. Uh, they think of the groin as more uh, high up in where the adductor inserts. So you need to ask them to point out where it hurts. The pain may be acute or insidious. They may complain of mechanical symptoms like catching, locking, or popping. Oftentimes they'll have discrete episodes of sharp pain with weight bearing, uh, pain sitting, pain uh, catching or rising, rising from a seated position. They may complain of difficulty going up and down stairs. Whereas people with extra articular problems, they have pain in their buttock, posteriorly in their, or of their hip, laterally over the trochanter, sometimes over the pubis. It can radiate to the groin, abdomen, or inner thigh. And they also may just have referred pain from the spine. And so you need to rule those things out because you're not gonna make those better with the scope. The patients with typical, this paper came out from, from Washington University in St. Louis, and they said, well, what are the symptoms of those with the labral tear? Unfortunately, this study came out in, nine, in 2006, and it was, I think our understanding of hip problems has really come a long way since then. They, but they basically say patients with hip labral tear, these are the symptoms, and I, I'm not so sure we can isolate them to labral tears because we know that 70 to 80% of adults in the United States who have no hip pain have uh, labral tears on MRI. But people who have symptomatic labral tears or what I would just say intraarticular hip pain tend to have insidious onset, but not, not always. Um, about a third of them do have acute onset. It's again, 90% of the time it's located in that groin inguinal crease region. Um, rarely or uncommonly does it actually go to the buttock and it usually is associated with activity. The examination, I think, and again, we don't have enough time to go through a thorough examination, but I think a thorough examination in all the patients is important. It should be consistent using the same general examination techniques each time. And then we do some specialty examinations based on where their symptoms are. And then we also have uh, confirmatory tests, including uh, imaging. Um, I, I actually did a study um, at Stanford with, uh, with the Mahorn group, uh, where the group that put together the IHOT score uh, to try and examine patients. And we're very, very poor at being able to diagnose the specific pathology in the joint that's causing the pain, but we are pretty good about being able to differentiate whether or not the pain is intraarticular or extraarticular. And I'll just kind of go over some of those keys. The first thing is a log roll test where you just have the patient laying down and you rotate their thigh. Um, that rotates the femoral head within the acetabulum, and that tends to be sensitive for intraarticular problems, but certainly not specific for any one diagnosis. It is especially useful for the acutely painful hip. The so-called impingement test here, I check internal rotation and flexion of 90 degrees, then I adduct and internally rotate. So the impingement test is flexion of 90, adduction and internal rotation. And though it's called the impingement test, it's almost always positive in impingement itself. Other pathologies can also hurt with that test and that causes pain in the anterior groin. So it's not pathognomonic for impingement itself. Intraarticular problems are not usually uh, tender to palpation. So it generally doesn't hurt when you uh, push on the uh, area uh, if it's within inside the joint, nor does it usually hurt with resisted muscle testing. So those are, tend to be extraarticular uh, sources of pain. We realize though that intraarticular pathology may present with concomitant issues. So it's not uncommon if somebody has pain in the joint, they've been favoring it for a while, that they develop some weakness um, and may develop some trochanteric bursitis, may develop some piriformis syndrome. So um, they can occur together. So what, what are the indications or what are some of the things that we can treat arthroscopically? Well, labral tears, we can remove, repair, or reconstruct the labrum. For chondral lesions, generally you can do a chondroplasty, you can do chondral repair, but uh, I have very fine indications for when I actually truly repair articular cartilage damage 
Generally, we'll do a microfracture for large lesions, but people have tried things like de novo and biocartilage to fill these chondral defects. With ligamentum teres tears, I debride ligamentum teres tears, but some people do reconstruct them, and uh, we can talk about if there's really an indication for that or not. FAI, uh, uh, we again, we'll get into this a little bit later this morning or evening for you guys, sorry. Uh, acetabuloplasty and chelectomy. Uh, for instability patients, we can do capsular plication and or capsular reconstructions. And even if for people with uh, uh, capsular defects, we can do uh, capsular reconstructions and repairs as well. Acetabular rim fractures, you can remove the rim fracture or you can internally fix the rim fracture um, endoscopically assisted. Other things, uh, we remove loose bodies and that's probably the clearest indication for hip arthroscopy uh, to remove loose bodies in a, a less morbid way and do that a lot with synovial chondromatosis. Uh, I find that doing a washout from, uh, arthroscopically uh, in the hip is actually a much, more, much less morbid procedure and, and very effective in, in, in uh, treating infected joints. Um, for alias psoas tendinopathy and internal snapping hip, so uh, both a native or post-total hip arthroplasty, um, doing a lengthening, and we're seeing an increasing prevalence of uh, uh, iliopsoas uh, irritation following total hip arthroplasty. And those probably are the most common uh, patients I do uh, iliopsoas lengthenings on, but I've also had some that have had adhesions that we've also released some adhesions around the iliopsoas. And then you can sometimes have these large periarticular cysts, and I've also addressed those uh, endoscopically. Tumor-like conditions of uh, treated synovial chondromatosis as well as osteochondromas um, uh, uh, arthroscopically around the hip, osteoidosteomas uh, for those cases that the uh, interventional radiologists aren't able to access, or, and even PVNS, um, more, generally the more focal nodular type of PVNS. I've treated some of the more um, uh, uh, the diffuse type, but um, I think sometimes you can get actually better uh, access to this through an open surgical dislocation. Uh, periarticular problems that we can treat with the scope include trochanteric bursectomy, um, as well as for gluteus medius pathology, such as tendinopathy or tears, we can debride and or repair the gluteus medius and or minimus. We can do partial resections of the IT band for external snapping hip. Uh, subspine impingement, which we'll touch briefly upon when we talk about impingement, for the AIIS is sitting a little bit proud or low. Uh, you can decompress that to relieve impingement of the hip. And an issue of femoral impingement, develop, I developed a technique of excising the lesser trochanter for those with symptomatic issue of femoral impingement. And then uh, uh, there's been an evolution in uh, addressing hamstring tears endoscopically, and we've done partial repairs, uh, but some people are doing complete avulsions um, uh, endoscopically as well. Things that I've not personally treated are uh, endoscopically, but have been treated uh, by others um, uh, using a scope. Uh, the, the deep gluteal space, Hal Martin has um, uh, really developed doing an arthroscopy of that for lysis of adhesions and piriformis release and being able to look at the sciatic nerve and make sure that sciatic nerve moves appropriately. Uh, Dean Matsuda has uh, fixed a couple of Pipkin fractures, uh, um, arthroscopically assisted as well as uh, having treated osteitis pubis with uh, partial resection and debridement uh, with the scope. And then Sochi Uchida in Japan has developed a shelf type of operation uh, to, for the management of uh, dysplasia. And uh, Dean Matsuda and, and uh, some others have worked on an arthroscopic assisted periacetabular osteotomy. So those are things that can be done, but I have not. So um, the part of the key is, I think, when, not just the physical examination, but proper imaging, I think it aids in the diagnosis. And I think it's particularly important around the hip to help assess the bony anatomy. Do they have impingement? Do they have dysplasia? Uh, Wenger showed that 87% of people with symptomatic um, uh, labral tears have uh, one of these two uh, anatomic features. And so from my standpoint, if those things are normal, I think you need to pay attention to maybe the person ha might have some instability. Um, you want to see if they have arthritis because that does affect the outcomes of hip arthroscopy and you may get some idea from the soft tissue, particularly with MR uh, imaging. So my general workup includes uh, a radiographic series of an AP pelvis x-ray, a true cross table laterals and a false profile view. Um, I think particularly when people are starting out with hip arthroscopy or people or patients that have 
unusual anatomy or may have had surgery, I think a CT scan can be helpful. And I tend to prefer an MR arthrogram. Um, we're using uh, anesthetic as the intraarticular contrast um, to see if the pain is coming from inside the joint. So the arthrogram or the contrast makes the uh, images better at being able to discern uh, more subtle pathology. But the real key is, since we know that there's such a high prevalence of asymptomatic labral tears, is that do they get pain relief with the intraarticular injection at least 50%? If they do, then you can be confident that the pain is coming from within the joint. So the pain relief, I think, is key. So I have the patients try to reproduce their pain prior to the injection. Then they get the injection, they do the MRI, and then I have them do the same maneuver to see if they get at least 50% relief of pain. There are some cases where the pain is coming from inside the joint, that, um, but they don't get much relief. And that could be either one, that the pain is actually not from inside the joint. Um, two, the, the, they may have missed with the injection, getting the injection to the joint. What I see here, particularly at the university, um, particularly in July, August, and September, when we have new fellows in radiology, is that uh, they're not very good at getting the needle in the joint and it becomes a traumatic injection. So the patient's getting multiple sticks. And so even the anesthetic doesn't help get rid of their pain because they've gotten st stuck so many times. The other thing we see about once a month or so is that some patients will not get pain relief um, at when we were using the gadolinium as the contrast. And um, the gadolinium can be sometimes noxious for some patients. And so if they have the, if I really suspect their pain is intraarticular and they had an MR arthrogram with gadolinium and an anesthetic and they didn't get the relief, then I'll send them for an ultrasound guided injection with just the anesthetic to determine if their pain is intraarticular. So my indications for uh, hip arthroscopy, if somebody has pain for more than 12 weeks, they, it's an intraarticular source of pain that, that, that's confirmed by getting relief with an intraarticular ropivacaine injection. The MR arthrogram shows evidence of some intraarticular pathology, and we've ruled out other potential sources of pain. The one caveat is that our, uh, hip arthroscopy in the face of arthritis is not a particularly great operation, particularly if somebody has more than 50% joint space loss um, when you compare the widest spot to the narrow, narrowest spot. If they have more than 50% loss of joint space, the results are poor and, um, at best and, and not as predictable. So when we talk about hip arthroscopy and scoping the hip, we talk about two main compartments of the hip, the central compartment, which is an artificial joint space that's basically within the confines of the acetabulum. And to access it, you need to apply traction of some sort. Whereas the peripheral compartment is along the femoral neck, it's still intraarticular, and you need to take the traction off to relax the capsule so that you can get inside the joint and maneuver around uh, in the peripheral compartment. And we do always scope both compartments in, in the patients. The equipment for hip arthroscopy, um, the way I, I do it, I use a fracture table. This is a setup, for, this is a photo from my OR. Um, we use fluoroscopy. We use uh, the hip arthroscopy systems. The, there are long scopes, but in all actuality, we don't need special long scopes for most patients. We generally just use scopes that have a modified bridge, which is the way they're being manufactured these days that allows more a better working length on the scope. But having a specialized cannulas and longer instrumentation allows access and maneuverability within the joint. One thing I particularly like is, some, is this uh, device, it's called the E-Flex. It's a radio frequency probe that's narrow and has a bendable tip um, that allows you to uh, get access and maneuver around in the uh, tight confines of the hip joint. One of the things that makes the hip also a little bit more unusual is that we use a 70 degree scope a lot, as well as a 30 degree lens. I tend to do these uh, patients under general anesthesia uh, with them paralyzed. I think it makes it easier to access the joint. You don't have to apply as much traction to the joint uh, to get it distracted. Uh, that reduces, I think, the risk of a pudendal nerve injury. Um, you can use a uh, lumbar plexus block as an adjunct, much like you'd use a femoral nerve block uh, when you do an ACL or an interscaling block when you do shoulder arthroscopy. But this is a particularly difficult um, block to get. And unless you have an anesthesiologist that's very um, good and comfortable with this, I, I, I generally don't do any, any of these blocks anymore. You can do hip arthroscopy under an epidural or a spinal, but again, I don't think you get quite the same or relaxation. While a lot of people do the arthroscopy using a pump, I don't, I use gravity with epinephrine in the bags and just use hypotensive anesthesia where their systolic blood pressure is 100. <clears throat> 
This would be the setup in my OR looking from above. I bring the fluoroscopy in between the legs. Um, so you abduct the legs and we'll talk about that later. But you bring the fluoro in. This would be where I'm standing. This is a scrub nurse and, and, and our assistant. And we can do all what we need to do here. Um, when we had carts, um, the monitor would be straight across uh, from the patient. Now we use boom so um, you can still get, uh, see the pictures from across the patient and then the fluoroscopy uh, pictures at the foot of the table. Um, you can do this also in a lateral position uh, as seen here where you bring the floral over or under. Um, I just don't like to have my arms over the patient trying to uh, go in front and behind of the trochanter. I think it's less comfortable position um, and I'm just more comfortable doing everything in a supine position. So I have the patient supine like this. Again, more photos from my OR. They're on a fracture table. You have a padded perineal post that's lateralized. So you wanna make sure you protect the genitals. The um, uh, leg is in a neutral uh, rotation, uh, neutral flexion, uh, flexion uh, um, extension and neutral rotation. Um, they're abducted about more like 15 degrees. Um, the, the key is we wanna make sure they're lateralized. So you can see that you don't have to get over the transverse ligament. It actually, your resultant vector is a little bit more in line with the femoral neck. Uh, when, when they're lateralized and it, as well as while protecting the genitals. Here you can see slight abduction about 15 degrees or so with neutral rotation, neutral flexion extension. Um, uh, I used to use a potentiometer on the bed, but I haven't found it to be accurate. Uh, so we stopped using a tensiometer, but most people say it takes about 12 to 50 pounds of force to distract the hip. Um, there's uh, a big trend in the last year or two to using postless traction where the patient's uh, friction between the bed and the patient uh, it, instead of a post is used and they still apply traction to the foot. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of people have found this useful. I, I'm concerned because I have several patients, I, I basically big, um, big individuals that are weighing 150 kilos. Um, I don't know that this will allow enough uh, distraction to get into the joint because I have trouble even with uh, using a post, but for, mo for your average patient, it may be fine. So the first thing I do when I do hip arthroscopy is I apply uh, traction on the leg, um, just gross traction, bring the fluoroscopy in, I, um, and then I apply regular traction to get the hip distracted. I prep with betadine uh, at the area of the lateral trochanter, and I bring a spinal needle in to remove the negative intraarticular pressure. So um, here you can see just a fluoros fluoroscopic photo with a needle overlying. Um, you apply initial traction and you can see when you put the needle in and you remove the uh, trocar from the needle, you can see the joint just opens up. As you remove the negative intraarticular pressure, the muscles around the joint will relax. When we do the arthroscopy itself, um, after, we, after we've distracted the hip joint, we take the traction off um, uh, and then prep and drape and then reapply the traction. And then we use a multiple cannulated system uh, uh, to get the trocar into the joint. So we start off with the spinal needle. Here's your femoral head. Here's your acetabulum. Here's your labrum. And there's a needle coming right through the capsule itself. And then through the needle, I bring a guide wire. And then um, at, over the guide wire, I bring in a blunt trocar and sheath. I prefer the blunt trocar um, so that I don't gouge anything. Uh, and, and then uh, we put the scope in. My first... When I, when I make the first portal, that's done under fluoroscopy only. The other portals are done under arthroscopic visualization. But once I make the second portal, I stop, put my scope in that second portal, and I look at the first portal to make sure that my, my first portal didn't go through the labrum like this um, uh, so that I limit the amount of damage to that labrum and I can reposition it if necessary. So the first portal I tend to use is the anterior lateral portal. Um, it's uh, safe and easy, and we basically bring it at the margin of the greater trochanter, um, uh, about a centimeter over the greater trochanter with the traction applied, um, close to the femoral head and accounting for anaversion. So here's uh, my, neat, my trocar coming in uh, over the needle, um, and then I put my scope in place, and with it, and I start off with a 70 degree scope, so I'm gonna go back here for a second. And with a 70 degree scope here, I've made my anterior portal and my posterior lateral portal. But what you can see, you can see the labrum anteriorly, you see the femoral head. I'm just rotating the lens. Here's my posterior lateral portal. That's the peripheral labrum laterally. And then I can come back up and look at the anterior lateral labrum. This patient has some synovitis as well. But with the 70 degree scope, you can see the periphery very well. You don't see the central area quite as well. 
Um, here's a 30 degree scope. You can see my postulateral portal. You can see some labrum. There's the head. There's my anterior portal and my cotyloid fossa. You can see very well. You'll, it, with hip arthroscopy, it's different than, than when you scope the knee. With the knee, you're moving the camera and the lens together. With the hip, you're really just rotating the lens. You're not moving the camera very much. My second portal is the anterior portal. And classically, we talked about it being at the junction of, the, of a line drawn anteriorly from the greater trochanter and inferior from the ASIS, because medial to that's your neurovascular structures um, and, and angled. But in all reality, we've changed that and we've gone to a, what's called the mid-anterior portal, which is more distal and medial to the anterior lateral portal, usually about seven um, centimeters or so at about a 45 degree angle. And so you want one of the keys when you make the anterior portal, whether or not it's a modified or a straight, is to cutting the skin only because of risk to the lateral form of continuous nerve, which is uh, subcutaneous and can be injured. Here you can see the anterior lateral and, and posterior lateral portals from the anterior portal with a 70 degree scope. You can see you can see the anterior labrum very nicely, almost to where the bottom of the uh, uh, cotyloid fossa is and the anterior uh, portion of the acetabulum. You can see along the periphery again. There's your a posterior lateral portal just off to your left there, but you also the anterior lateral portal. So you've got a great skyline view of the of the head and the acetabulum with the 70 degree scope. Whereas with the 30 degree scope, you can see your labrum. You can see not as well in the periphery, the, the anterior lateral and posterior lateral portals again. And then you can see the cotyloid fossa quite well with the 30 degree lens. And so again, I'm just rotating the lens around to kind of get my full view of what's going on in the hip. And then the last portal I make is the posterior lateral portal that's down here. It's usually in line with my anterior lateral portal just on the other side of the greater trochanter. You wanna make sure your legs in neutral rotation because of risk to the sciatic nerve. So here you can see, this is an old photo. I've got my anterior portal, the old anterior portal as it was what I call it, um, sitting up here, my anterior lateral, and now down here, my posterior lateral portal. And here you can see the posterior labrum very nicely, the femoral head, Looking up around, there's your anterior lateral portal, and there you can see your straight anterior portal as well. You can see quite a bit of the cotyloid fossa. You can see the joint surface, and but you can see the labrum particularly well almost all the way around just by rotating the lens. With the 30 degree, you can still see some of the posterior lateral labrum, but again, you can see the cotyloid fossa and central femoral head very well with, this, with the 30 degree scope. You don't see that anterior portal quite as well because it's kind of hidden, hidden back there. They're just to see a little bit of it. So some of the variants of normal, um, this is why we'd normally see if somebody would be sent to me as a labral tear and it's actually a cleft between the labrum and the acetabulum. Normally it's a smooth transition and not a cleft, but this is normal. As you can see, normal articular cartilage going over it, kind of like the types of slap lesions. Sometimes you can get fooled about whether or not something's a slap lesion on your MRI and, it's, and you see the normal articular cartilage coming over the top. These, this is the triiradiate cartilage. So in your 20 year old individuals, you might see some remnant of their uh, triiradiate cartilage. That's not a chondral lesion. There's a so-called supraacetabular fossa where the um, cotyloid fossa has appearance more like a, a, a keyhole, if you will. Uh, and then the stellate crease, which seems to be like closure of that supraacetabular fossa, normal variant, not felt to be associated with any pathology. And finally, with, for the peripheral compartment, we take the traction off. Some people like to flex the hip to relax the anterior capsule and ligaments uh, and make a distal portal. Uh, and with that, you can uh, look along from the femoral, uh, from the rim of the acetabulum on down. Fortunately, I'm sorry, this video wasn't running this morning. I don't know why, but basically, you can see this is your labrum. You can see the seal of the labrum over the femoral head. You can see how the capsule doesn't insert into the labrum and inserts into the uh, acetabulum. Uh, and then you can look all along the femoral neck. I'll show you a different video with some femoral neck uh, picture. This is your uh, zona orbicularis. Um, down here on this video, you'll see the uh, medial synovial fold, which is your landmark in the perfect compartment. But, so there's your zona. There's your medial synovial fold. You see some soft tissue reflection at the femoral head neck junction. And this, um, my probe is on the, actually the um, iliopsoas. So if I'm gonna do an iliopsoas lengthening, I can cut the capsule right there um, to cut, uh, to identify the iliopsoas. And actually you can also get to the back of the femoral neck. 
So I've tried to cover a lot but in, in a short amount of time, only having 20 minutes to discuss about hip arthroscopy, but the indications for hip arthroscopy continue to broaden as technology has uh, really helped uh, advance access and, and better understanding pathologies. It's definitely though a very prolonged learning curve um, and complication rates are associated with, uh, uh, or drop in complication rates are associated with the increase in, in uh, uh, number of cases you've done. But there's a lot of things that can be done with the hip scope. Um, we're still defining what are the true indications and where our limitations and contraindications are. And I think um, uh, we're, that's the big next phase of where we are with, with hip arthroscopy. But I think we'll continue to be able to do more with advancing technology. And some people think that really we're only doing about 10% of the things that can be done in the hip uh, with the scope are currently being done with the hip. So I think there's going to be more to come and that's going to be the future. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Mark, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, that was a great talk. Um, Thank you. Just a couple, a couple of questions. <clears throat> uh, I've always been told that you need a huge post, center post. And from your pictures I've seen, you've just used the regular post. How does that work? So, um, yeah, I, I, the issue was that um, the reason why people recommend a huge post is because uh, of the risk of pudendal nerve injury. Right. And, um, and people have talked about using these massive posts. And when I tried some of those massive posts, what I found was that they were generally of low density foam. Right. And so I spent most of my traction time getting rid of the, the foam before I got any traction, the foam density right. before I got any traction on the hip joint itself. So then I started to wrap those big, big posts with some Coban to to increase the density of it so that I'm not spending as much time getting rid of the air from the post, if you will, to apply traction to the joint. What I essentially do is I take a regular hip arthroscopy, padded hip arthroscopy post, I put a gel foam or a gel around it, and I put some, uh, some uh, web roll around that just to keep it kind of clean and to help hold it in place. And, I, and that's all I do. And if, I, if you have the patient paralyzed, if you have them lateralized, you generally don't get pudendal nerve injuries. Um, and so for me, I think once I started, when I was doing that, I would probably get maybe 2% incidence of pudendal nerve. Then um, what I really started to make a point of when I first start the surgery and position the patient, we bring them all the way down. They're, they're growing against the perineal post grossly. Then I apply traction to the non-operative leg, right. make sure they're lateralized in just with body weight. Then we start to apply traction to the surgical leg. And with that, I haven't seen a pudendal nerve injury in several years at this point. Right. Uh, secondly, uh, you talked about postless traction. Yes. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a pop, that something that's, that's something that's new here. Right. Um, and what, what you basically do is they, uh, they use a, a kind of almost like a sticky foam on top of the OR table. Mm -hmm. And they even may put some straps um, right. uh, and, and uh, basically relying on the friction of the patient's body weight, they put them in a little bit of Trendelenburg. Um, and with that, they find if the patient, the patient not sliding down, you can apply traction. And there's some people that are very big believers. It's interesting about 10 years ago, I worked with a um, engineering class at Stanford, trying to figure out a way to do hip arthroscopy without a post to reduce the risk of nerve injury and, um, Hal Martin has shown that the blood flow to the uh, femoral uh, ner nerve vascular structures was reduced when you apply traction. So we were looking at alternatives to apply traction to get the hip distracted without using a post. And not a, you know, I, I, I think it's a little risky doing um, uh, ha uh, Hassan Sadri's technique of using a femoral distractor uh, in the pelvis and in the in the femur to, <laughs> to get into the joint. So. Um, we were looking at other techniques and actually the engineering students had come up with, why don't we use just body weight and, and something like that. And I just thought there's just not a, it just doesn't make sense to me that we can get enough distraction that way. And, and for a while there, Carlos Guanche was trying that as well, you know, post distraction. And, um, he went away from it and went back to using a, a regular distractor, but there's a wave of enthusiasm. Now there's probably about Oh, I don't know, probably a good 20, 30 guys that I know that are using it almost routinely. And they say they've not had to switch to a post, but they always keep the post nearby in case, in case they need it. So 
do you do you have a weight limit for postless traction less than 100 kilos so i don't do postless traction um, don't do postless, right. i don't because um like i said i've had i've had some athletes that are uh, you know, probably once every i don't know three four years i'll get somebody i can't distract and right. they're usually they're usually 150 kilos mm -hmm. you know they're two two and a half meters tall <laughs> and i just you know they're massive guys that i just can't and even under paralysis it, you know i have a very hard time getting them distracted um and i just don't see how this would work for if it if it can't doesn't work with a post it's not going to work without a post but you know, there's people between where I apply a lot of traction to, you know, a lot of force to get them distracted. And, uh, and I don't see that I can generate that. It probably works for your average person, particularly, you know, your, uh, your dancers and gymnasts and loose jointed individuals who are light, right. and small, but, yeah. but not, uh, not for some of the uh, American football players and right. wrestlers and things like that. Mark, Mark, uh, how do you, how do you prevent the neurovascular injuries while making antero anterolateral portal? Because we are going very close to the anterolateral vascular structures, and uh, is there any trick to avoid the neurovascular damage be because of distraction? Because sometimes when you are going to distract the hip, maybe around twenty five pounds, the uh, the denomination may not be that great for you to understand what exactly is the stretch. And stretch is the one which is not, uh, you know, accepted by the neurovascular structure as the damage. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you, in all reality, I don't know that we do enough stretch, that there's enough stretch to the extremity to cause injury to the femoral nerve. There have been a couple of femoral nerve cases reported. There's been a couple of sciatic nerve cases reported. Mm -hmm. I've not had either one in, in I have done now probably 2,000 hip scopes. Mm -hmm. um, or probably more than that, actually, and we've not seen any any of those injuries, though they are reported. I think that the sciatic nerve injury may be a direct function of um, from direct trauma uh, because it's not far from the joint itself. And I think that the femoral nerve, if you stay with your portals lateral to the a uh, uh, ASIS, then you should be safe from the neurovascular structures um, medially. So the, the ones that are really most at risk are going to be your uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And a way to avoid that for the most part is um, just making sure you cut the skin, though sometimes the, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve will still, uh, you still end up with some numbness in the lateral thigh from manipulation of that portal anteriorly. Um, it's only if you're really, really unlucky and your needle goes through the, through a branch of the nerve and then everything else is going to go through that. But generally, that's not an issue. The other one is the pudendal nerve uh, from the pressure, the yeah. groin from the post itself. But um, the femoral, the femoral nerve vasculature, uh, femoral artery, femoral nerve, femoral vein. If you stay, if you stay uh, lateral to the uh, ASIS, uh, you should be safe. Yeah. A second thing is uh, when you start doing hip arthroscopy, up, once you go through the portal, do you like to do the, uh, the peripheral scopy first or the central? Because sometimes you may not require the traction for your peripheral arthroscopy, which is in the beginning phase. And after that, you can give traction and you, you can do the central scopy later. So what is the sequence? The central first, periphery second, or say periphery first and central second? So I opted to do um, uh, central first, and then I go to the periphery. And the reason I do that, and there's some people who like to go a peripheral first because then they can see them entering the central compartment and, and have minimal or no risk of injuring the labrum on their entry, um, which is, I think, the clear advantage. I think the problem with going peripheral first is that you end up, uh, you can have, I think, more extravasation of the fluid in the soft tissues, which I think can affect your maneuverability within the joint. So I think if I can keep it in the central compartment first, the other part of it is, especially earlier on or when I'm trying to do something really complex, like uh, when I was first starting to do the takedown of these uh, femoral acetabular, I'm sorry, uh, these acetabular non-unions, acetabular rim non-unions, and I was trying to take down the non-union arthroscopically and then fix it uh, endoscopically. Because there's no really good instruments for that, it takes a while to sometimes do that. And so I try to limit my traction, certainly to under two hours, but um, even if it's requiring a lot of force, I may even uh, cut my traction time off at about an hour, an hour and a half. And, uh, and in that case, I can 
work in the central compartment for my hour, hour and a half, and I could take the traction off, do my peripheral compartment work, and then I can go back to the central. But probably, you know, when I, when I have sometimes either really significant overcoverage of the uh, acetabulum and I have trouble getting in the joint because I have significant overcoverage, um, or uh, if I have trouble just distracting the joint, I will start in the peripheral compartment first and then go to the central. But, you know, uh, again, mostly the, the real issue from my standpoint is the extravasation of the, so of the fluid um, and uh, try to limit that. Uh, what about the decision making? Because sometimes it's very difficult to diagnose the uh, FAI or radiologically uh, find out where is the impingement, whether it's a femoral impingement, whether it's an acetabular impingement, the pincer, the effect. Radiologically, plain radiology is very difficult. So how do you uh, design your decision making, especially for anterior hip pain? Uh, does, does the radiological sign mind uh, gives you enough clue to diagnose this? Well, so the radiologic signs give me a good clue to the diagnosis. They I'm talking obviously, about plain x-ray, plain x-ray, Mark. I'm talking about plain x-ray. Plain x-ray. Yeah. Yeah, plain x-rays. In fact, I, to be honest with you, MRIs are to make sure I don't miss anything else. Um, and, it, and uh, but the reality is my, my diagnoses generally come from the plain x-rays. And, in, in, and if you ask me how would I most efficiently take care of patients, it would be plain x-ray series, I think you have to have a good plain x-ray series, and an intraarticular injection, which can be done under ultrasound. And with that, I can figure out most of what I need to figure out. Though um, the MRI is to make sure I don't miss anything in it. And you know, I recently had a case where the patient had PVNS and had pretty significant PVNS. And I, you know, without the MRI, you wouldn't know that. The, um, I, the other part of it, um, as far as acetabular or femoral, the other thing I look at is the pattern of damage in the joint. Um, and I'll, when I talk about the FAI, I'll, t I'll show you about the pattern of damage of FAI. I'll show you the pattern of damage of instability um, and the damage of cam FAI versus pincer. But I let the, the, the damage um, kind of dictate how much I remove. There are some guys that I know that always do their FAI surgery off the femoral side because they say, well, we, you know, the only thing you can do with, if you remove too much bone on the acetabular side, you can cause dysplasia. And there's no proof that pincer FAI leads to arthritis. The data is very uh, equivocal, but the cam FAI does potentially lead to arthritis. So um, there, some people are more aggressive about doing cam resection and not doing anything on the pincer side or on the acetabular side. Whereas I know there's a doctor in Chicago who does almost everything off the acetabular side. Uh, that way he doesn't have any risk of femoral neck fracture and he can get his patients moving faster. But I think that's, you know, uh, I, I think you'd need to address where the damage is, where the pathology is. And sometimes it's a bit off the acetabular side, it's a bit off the femoral side, both. And so you need to address, I think, both as opposed to only doing it on one side or only do the other. But I think the plain x-rays can help you a lot if you get the right series. So an AP pelvis, um, a true cross table lateral, and then a false profile view. The false profile view will give you your anterior center edge angle. Your AP will get your lateral center edge angle. The uh, false profile will show you the anterior lateral uh, um, uh, femur, uh, which is where the pathology usually is. And then the AP and lateral will show you the, the lateral and AP ports of the femoral neck. So you'll get all the, all the views that you need to get from, from those three views. Okay, Roshan? Yeah, yes, Dr. Anton. Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark, very, very enlightening lecture. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, good old days in the 90s, uh, I had written a paper on pubic pain syndrome. And this is, uh, those days the hip arthroscopy was nowhere. And um, nowadays there's a lot of uh, emphasis on pubic pain syndrome or athletics pubic pain syndrome, which gives rise to some hip pathology. Uh, and uh, quite a number of them get uh, better after they have done uh, hip uh, scopy and the lesions. Uh, what are the kinds of uh, lesions that you see in pubic pain syndrome? Well, so I'll show a video on why I think FAI is associated with, um, with uh, pubic pain syndrome. But, you know, it's funny, as you said, I, I, I've spent some time with Per Holmish, and he used to talk about how the 1980s were the decade of the abductor of injuries. The 90s were 
uh, sports hernia, um, yeah. and then yeah. the 2000s were FAI, yeah. um, and then somewhere in there was also iliopsoas. So the um, uh, you know I, I think our understanding of that area has gotten better. Um, I, th I think we're a little bit more careful about the diagnoses about calling every, whether you call something osteitis pubis or is it, is it a core muscle injury now is the common term for the sports hernia. Is it a deductor? Is it the iliopsoas? I think we're getting better and better at being able to differentiate those things. Um, and I think there's, you know, each one has a different etiology for the most part, as far as the adductors versus the iliopsoas and how you treat it. But I think that the sports, so-called sports hernia and uh, the uh, osteitis pubis, um, I think they, those things go very much uh, in in hand in hand with the FAI, because I think, and I'll show this, that when you have impingement, um, the loss of femoral head and neck offset or acetabular overcoverage, when you're doing activities like soccer or other sports where you're taking your hips through the extremes of motion and the, the femoral head neck area hits the acetabulum, you either have to limit your range of motion of your joint. So you have to shorten your stride or you try to make it up by compensating by trying to get extra motion somewhere else like the spine or the pubic symphysis or the SI joint. And that's where I think you get those stresses and why you get the, uh, the impingement. Dr. Millen? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. okay. can, I, can I just come in, Roshan? Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Please. I think, I think uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what Dr. Mark is saying is, and Dr. What Dr. Dr. Antao's question was, I think FAI is one of the DDs of the groin pain. And in a consensus meeting held in Doha, the sports hernia term has been changed. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'm right, Dr. Mark, right? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. So that consensus meet says that FAI is a DD of uh, groin pain. And groin pain basically is not only osteitis, it could be a, a bone marrow edema in the pubis, which gives rise to pubic pain syndrome could be adductor tendinopathy and iliopsoas, as Dr. Mark said. So FAI is a DD, and I don't think groin pain in athletes can be dealt with arthroscopically because it is essential and extra-articular cause. So if at all in incalcitrant cases where patients do not respond, then it is open debridement of the adductor tendon or the pubic symphysis or sometimes fusion of the pubic symphysis in case of uh, very resistant osteitis pubis cases. So I think arthroscopy principles, they don't apply there. Do you agree to me? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the answer is, it, it, um, in some cases it can. Uh, so what we found is that when you've looked at, uh, Chris Larson did a study looking at professional fo American football players that had impingement and what we now call core muscle injury. They, what we used to call the sports hernia. On the core muscle injury that they almost always ended up getting, having to get hip arthroscopy because okay. they still had some pain. If they did had a hip arthroscopy, there was a, uh, about half of the players were able to get back to play and it resolved their core muscle injury because it reduced the stresses there, but half still required the core muscle surgery as well. So I think, and when I've talked to Patrick Carton, who's a, um, uh, a hip arthroscopist in um, Ireland, he used to always do the sports, uh, the, the core muscle injury surgery himself. And he said that since he's been doing hip arthroscopy, his core muscle injury surgery rate has dropped precipitously. So I think you can reduce those stresses to help with the pubic symphysial edema um, and or uh, some of the, those other pains and stresses to that area. So I think you, so I think there is a role for hip arthroscopy. It doesn't address where the primary symptoms are, but I think it may address the underlying cause that led to those symptoms to begin with. So uh, you mean uh, uh, when you have adductor tendinopathy, the major cause of adductor tendinopathy is imbalance between the adductors and abductors. Where you have weaker abductors, these, these athletes are more prone for going into uh, the groin pain. Uh, and dealing with these issues, Restrengthening, reconditioning these muscles. You say that in all groin pain patients, or what we used to call as sports hernia, hip arthroscopy is a must. No, okay. no, I don't either. 
because only when people have both symptoms. So I actually have a professional tennis player that came to me who had only symptoms of core muscle injury, adductor, lower abdominal muscle, a lot of pain. It was affecting his ability to play tennis. Yeah. Um, and he had arthroscopically, I mean, he had um, on a CT scan, clear evidence mm -hmm. of, of uh, FAI. Yeah. And he had even a os acetabulae, which I think is associated with it. And so people were recommending hip arthroscopy for him. And he came to see me for that. And I said, he has no pain from his hip joint whatsoever. He does have some limited motion, but he had no pain whatsoever in his hip joint. So I said, get the core muscle injury operated on. I think that'll take care of your problem. And, um, and I said, I can't be sure that it may not come back because you're not taking care of the underlying thing, but core muscle surgery, patients are back in six weeks, you know, hip arthroscopy to get back to sports six months to eight months to get back to the professional level. So I told him, try the core muscle injury surgery um, alone. And within a year, he had broken the top 100 in the world on the ATP tour. And uh, he's now eight or nine years since then, still hasn't had his hip scoped, mm. continues to be a top 100 player. Okay. So I think there's a role, it's, it's a, there's a role, but I think if they have symptoms of the hip and symptoms of the core, right. then I think you can, if you only do the core surgery, you'll be back to do the hip surgery. So can, can you just enlighten us on what this core surgery, core muscle uh, mm. surgery deals about? Is it only adductor tenotomy or something else to it? No, there's more to it. Um, I don't do the surgery. Uh, and, I've, and I've watched several people do the surgeries to trying to see if I would be something that I would, that I might want to do as part of my practice. Some people seem to do just a standard hernia repair um, with that or without posterior mesh. Superior, posterior, posterior superior abdominal wall repairs. Correct. So they're done endoscopically, right? It can be done endoscopically or it can be done open. Right. Um, but the, you know, the reason why sports hernia went away as a term is because there's no hernia associated it's, with it. It's a, pseudo, it's, it's, it's a misnomer. Yeah, it's a misnomer. But some people still do a hernia repair for it, and it does seem to help a lot of people. Yes, yes. There's some that do adductor, just an, a true adductor uh, tenotomy. Um, and there's some that do even more extensive than just an adductor tenotomy. Um, and then I, I think uh, Muschewick, who's the surgeon in Germany who does so many, actually does kind of a, a hernia repair open and cuts the iliohypogastric nerve, okay. which, uh, you know, um, which I'm sure just cutting the nerve maybe helps get rid of the pain because the nerve is cut. I don't know that it does anything else. Um, okay, okay. I think that was a wonderful discussion. I never heard, heard on so much on groin pain. Yeah. Tanta. I, I think in your 30 years, you must have never heard so much about groin pain. So <laughs> I think I think we should move on to... It's a, it's a huge topic, Roshan. Yeah, yeah. Groin pain, if you want, we will have one one full webinar Just on, on groin that, pain. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Groin pain. Next time, next time, next webinar is on groin pain. So <laughs> I'll recommend to Mark. Yes, yes, Prashant. Prashant, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, to Mark. Have you... That was the last you, question. Uh, hi, Mark. Hi. Have you doing... Uh, hip arthroscopy, any indication uh, for the AVN? For AVN. Yes, AVN. Any stage two, stage three? Uh, yeah, I think indication? if once there's stage three, I think there's really not much of a role for AVN. Okay. Um, though I did talk to somebody, there was a, a recently, something that you could consider doing if they had a stage three would be to try to see if you can from underneath lift it up and bone graft behind it arthroscopically assisted so that you can look at the joint. But I think once there's collapse, you've, the game's lost for the most part. Um, and so there, you can use, I think, hip, hip scope to evaluate the articular cartilage and to evaluate for collapse. But otherwise, I don't really know that there's much, much else role. I, it's still, I think, doing core decompression and, and that sort of thing uh, for stage one and two. But once there's collapse, Really, I think the only change since I was in training for that might be to consider if you have a young person with AVN with collapse, is to consider doing an open surgical dislocation with an osteochondral allograft. Um, but, but otherwise, I'm not sure that there's, you know, so I think just a scope would help from a staging standpoint. I'm not, um, and to make sure if you're coring that you're not entering the joint, I guess. But otherwise, not, not much of a role uh, for hip arthroscopy and AVN. 
And my experience, having scoped a couple of hips with AVN, is that they don't do well. Mark, there's a tendency nowadays to do scopic surgery in all the old time uh, open surgery. So there's a surgery for AVN called Sujioka osteotomy that you rotate the head. Uh, uh, can this be done in uh, with hip astrophysics? Because there you are seeing under vision, this portion of the articular surface is depressed, and then you can turn up to the better surface. Yeah, the the, the I, you know I I early in my training in residency, I was uh, involved in a Sujioka uh, rotational osteotomy. That is a hard operation. <laughs> yeah, and um, I could do it. <laughs> So that is a hard operation, and nobody in the United States seems to have been able to replicate those results. So no, nobody hard in the world. You want to do hardly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's better, yeah. uh, Leo. We should jump on to the next. I talk. think we should move on. Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, Doctor Safran, uh, could you yes. get on to the next talk, please? FAI. Yep. Thank you. So we can share the screen. Can you see that? Uh, no, not yet. We are not. Okay, hold on. Uh, Just well, open your presentation and share the screen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. This is not the right that. talk, though. No, no, okay. This is the old talk. Previous talk. Let me see. Nope, I do. Let's try that again. There we go. So this might help explain some of the. Uh, I'll just mute everyone, Mark. Okay, can you see that, Roshan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can see it. I, I just unmuted you so that you can okay. see it. Yeah. So this is about FAI diagnosis and management. And um, uh, you'll see how there's some relation to the uh, uh, core muscle injury. So just for starters, this is from um, one of the original papers uh, by Gans, where the upper left is what would be the normal anatomy of the femoral head neck area and acetabulum. Pincer impingement is where you have excessive uh, uh, acetabular over coverage, either globally or focally. Cam impingement is loss of this femoral head neck offset. And then the majority of people have some combination of the two. And impingement was originally described as internal rotation causing impingement of the femoral head neck junction against the acetabulum. But the more you flex the hip, the less internal rotation necessary to cause impingement, and as well as when you adduct, less motion necessary to cause impingement of the femoral head neck junction. But as we learn more about this, you also can see that you can have impingement even with straight abduction, depending on where your over coverage is of the acetabulum or your loss of femoral head neck offset. We classically talk about the cam impingement where the femoral head actually goes beyond um, a sphere created around the femoral head itself. So the epiphysis protrudes laterally out of the circle. And this tends to be at the location of the epiphysis, which is why we think this has to do with development um, uh, when people are in their teenage years. And this is, accounts for also the so-called pistol grip deformity, where the lateral contour of the femoral head neck extends into a convex shape beyond the base of the neck. And the pathology of, the, of impingement is this. When you have this loss of the femoral head neck junction, you butt against the edge of the acetabulum, you cause a labral chondral separation, and then it tends to hit up against the edge of the articular cartilage, softening and then delaminating the articular cartilage from the acetabulum. So looking at it up close, you initially spare the labrum, but cause a labral chondral separation. You butt against the rim of the acetabulum. You start to push on the uh, articular cartilage. It's what people call the so-called carpet effect, like if you stub your toe on the carpet, it lifts up uh, of not where your toes are. And the pathology tends to be articular cartilage damage that's focal, so in the area that's anterior superior in the acetabulum, but deep, so it goes in about uh, up to a centimeter or more from the rim of the acetabulum. And that's in, and the pathology is different from what you see in pincer impingement, where pincer impingement, there's several different types of pincer impingement that have been or, uh, uh, descriptions that cause in pincer impingement. You can have, uh, but basically the, what ends up happening is you actually get crushing of the labrum uh, between the acetabulum and the head neck junction. And as you continue to try to move the hip, you start to lever on this uh, head neck junction area and cause what's called a contra coup injury, which is on the other side of the joint. And so you can see this with coxa profunda, protrusio, acetabular retroversion, 
um, global uh, over coverage, and even with ossified labrum. So looking at the different types, Coxa profunda, which is originally described by the Swiss is where the floor of the cotyloid fossa goes beyond the ileoischial line. And, but the problem is I see that with dysplasia. So I'm not sure how dysplasia is coxa profunda. And so they actually revised and said, well, it's, they also have to have an increased center edge angle of more than 35 to 40 degrees for this to be true coxa profunda. Protrusio they described though, and if you look in literature, there's a lot of different descriptions of how, how people define protrusio, but the way the Swiss defined it was where the femoral head gets to or beyond the ileoischial line. What you see probably most commonly is a so-called cranial retroversion. And, and so if you look at, um, at this picture on your left, the posterior wall is always lateral to the anterior wall when you look at an AP pelvis x-ray. But some you can have it like it is on the right where there's a so-called crossing sign where the anterior superior portion of the, um, of the acetabulum is lateral to the posterior wall. And so that can cause some over coverage anterior superiorly. And so here you can see diagrammatically the difference between normal antiversion and this cranial retroversion itself. And you, you got to look at this not on an AP hip x-ray, but on an AP pelvis x-ray because the beams diverge. But this, so this is just coned down from an AP pelvis x-ray. But if you look, here's a line of the posterior and then the anterior walls. And you can see this so-called figure of eight or so-called crossing sign. And that would be a clue for anterior superior over coverage or cranial retroversion. And then you can have absolute retroversion. And so as Roshan had asked about not using MRI, but plain x-rays. I mean, here with this plain x-ray, you can see plenty of issues regarding um, uh, retro retroversion. So the blue dot is the center of the femoral head. Usually the posterior wall of the acetabulum crosses uh, the, the center of the femoral head. Here you don't see it, it's medial to it. So that's retroversion right there. But here you can see that's your uh, posterior wall and that's your anterior wall. So you see a crossing sign. Another clue is the, whoops, is the so-called ischial spine sign. So you see the ischial spines on this AP pelvis X-ray jutting into the, into this uh, uh, pelvis. And that's a sign of, uh, of retroversion as well. Um, and so here's the pathophysiology of this. You get the crushing of the labrum. Um, and then you'll oftentimes see even a notch in the femoral head neck junction from the crushing of the labrum against the rim of the acetabulum. And as you continue to hit, you get some cartilage damage up the anterior superiorly, but you also get this contra coup injury. So what you tend to see with pincer impingement is a narrow area of articular cartilage damage, but it involves a lot of the acetabular rim, not just anterior superiorly. When you look at the prevalence of FAI on a systematic review that was done by uh, Rachel Frank, she looked at 26 studies, include over 2000 hips, Looking at the prevalence of FAI in asymptomatic individuals, mind you again, asymptomatic, mean alpha angle, and I'll show you how we measure alpha angle in a bit, was 54.1. Some people say that greater than 55 is abnormal. So they found the incidence of CAM lesions was 37% of the individuals uh, who were asymptomatic had uh, anatomy of CAM FAI. But when you looked at the athletes here in this diagram, it was up to 60% of athletes had CAM FAI in asymptomatic athletes. Um, pincer uh, was uh, two thirds of people had some pincer anatomy and the incidence of labral injury based on MRI was again, 68% in asymptomatic individuals. So, you know, as Jimmy Andrews once taught me, if you want to operate on somebody, just get an MRI um, because <laughs> it'll show the pathology, whether or not they have symptoms or not. Um, but here you can see there's a high prevalence. So it's a, it's a function of putting the x-ray together with the clinical examination. When you look at it in athletes, again, uh, so this was, you're looking at the Copenhagen study uh, that was an arthritis study, longitudinal, large, uh, um, uh, longitudinal study of over 3,000 people, 17% of the males and 4% of the females had the anatomy of FAI. This was only on um, AP uh, x-ray though. Um, but when you look at um, athletes in the United States, 90% of uh, Americans that were invited to play professional football or to be evaluated to see about playing professional football. They go through what's called the combines. And so it's about 300 or so uh, football players. They all got x-rays and over 90% had x-ray appearance of at least one finding of, of FAI. 94% of uh, symptomatic football players had changes uh, consistent with FAI. 70% of elite hockey players had CAM FAI 
And the reason that they only know about CAM is because this was done with MRI and you can't really assess the acetabular morphology as well on MRI as with x-rays. So again, why plain x-rays are more helpful for me than MRIs are in being able to make the diagnosis. And when we talk about CAM FAI, this comes from uh, Martin Beck and, Mar and Gans. They suggest CAM FAI tends to occur in young males that are athletic, whereas pincer, ten isolated pincer, middle-aged females that are athletic. But the vast majority of people have a combination of both CAM and pincer FAI, in addition to some of these other uh, intraarticular findings of labral damage, chondral damage, and even premature arthritis. So the evaluation of the patient with FAI, again, they tend to have pain here in the groin. Yeah, they oftentimes will say, hey, I have problems putting on my socks and shoes. It's hurt, problematic when they sit for long periods of time. So here in Silicon Valley, I have a lot of engineers that uh, sit at the computer and hack away for uh, and work on the computers for long periods of time. So it hurts with that, but also with sporting activities, they have pain squatting, doing cutting or pivoting activities like soccer, uh, problems with sudden stops and starts. They oftentimes complain of pain going upstairs or hills more so than down. And then they just may say, I have limited range of motion uh, and pain. Um, <coughs> again, we do the impingement test where we flex to 90, adduct and internally rotate. I also do the, what I call the labral stress test, which is like a McMurray's test of the hip where you start in flexion, abduction, external rotation, and you adduct and internally rotate. And then you adduct and externally rotate where you're trained to see if you can catch the labrum in there while, while uh, moving the leg around. Now, I see a lot of people with FAI that may have had other surgeries or, and certainly they have pain in other locations and the pain can be in the pubic symphysis as we were talking about, the SI joint, the lumbar spine. It's amazing the number of individuals I see 30 and under that have FAI that have had spine surgery um, and, and even the so-called sports hernia or core muscle injury. So if you take a look at this, when you run, just like any activities, you flex the hip, you adduct and you internally rotate with the running, okay? And so that's flexion, adduction, internal rotation is your is what is impingement. So normally, if you have normal femoral head neck offset, and normal acetabulum, you get good clearance and you can you can maintain a full stride. But if you have loss of the femoral head neck offset or acetabular over coverage, you're going to impinge, and you either have to limit your stride or you can make up the motion somewhere else. One place is the pubic symphysis where you can have some motion. I think that can lead to this so-called osteitis pubis. But the muscles that are stabilizing that joint aren't mechanically designed to do that. And I think those can get injured and give you that core muscle injury. We see a lot of individuals that have SI joint pain and uh, Patrick Birmingham has shown that actually impingement does lead to motion at either the pubic symphysis or the SI joint. And I don't know why some get one and versus the other. And certainly the most mobile joint upstream from the hip is gonna be your spine. And so you can get the set uh, problems or you can get uh, excessive pressure on the disc which is why you'll have young people with significant back problems. And I think it's related to the, to the FAI and trying to maintain their, their mobility. So we start with the proper x-rays, which is getting a true AP of the pelvis. You want your coccyx one to three centimeters over the pubic symphysis. Your obturator should be symmetric. Here you can see your post, anterior and posterior walls of the acetabulum. So you can see for the cranial retroversion, you can see if the femoral head is out of round. So you've got your cam lesion on this patient. You can see you have os acetabuli bilaterally. So these rim injuries. Um, you can see the uh, floor of the cotyloid fossa as well as the iliocial line to look for coxa profunda and or protrusio. Um, and so you can get a lot of information from the plain x-ray as well as looking for arthritis. <laughs> Um, you need a lateral x-ray as well. A, a lot of people find it's just easier to get a, la um, a frog lateral, which is good at showing you the, the loss of femoral head neck offset if you don't have the overlap of the greater trochanter, which can obscure it sometimes. But the reality is this is still an AP of the acetabulum, and I think you need to get a lateral of the acetabulum. So I, my preference is to get a cross-table lateral. It's easier for our x-ray techs to get. And here you can see the big cam lesion, but I can also get a good lateral view of the, of the acetabulum. You wanna make sure that the greater trochanter is not posterior, that it's in line so that they have the appropriate orientation and rotation. Some people like to get a so-called modified done view, either at 90 or 45 degrees. Again, it can sometimes be hard to see the head neck junction, but again, it's still an AP of the acetabulum. It's not a lateral. Some people think it does show the anterior lateral aspect of the head neck junction better though, um, than, and certainly does better than an AP pelvis or, or a uh, 
across table lateral. But that's why I like to get a false profile view because that also shows me it's a weight bearing view. So it shows me if you have joint space narrowing, it's good for looking at acetabular morphology. I can look at the anterior center edge angle, which I think is very important um, because I have seen some people that have been referred to me where the, the anterior acetabulum was probably shallow to begin with. And then they had an acetabuloplasty and now they were um, dysplastic and developed arthritis. MRIs, you can get a lot of information from the MRI. Here you can see the uh, loss of sphericity of the femoral head neck junction. You can see the labrum is rounded as, as opposed to a triangle, but you can also see labral chondral injury. Here you can see some articular cartilage damage. The MRIs are not great at looking at articular cartilage damage, but I know this person has combined FAI because you can also see that, see that notch on the femoral head neck junction from pinching up against the acetabulum. <clears throat> Another clue that I like is that you can see the so-called pit's pit, which is the herniated, uh, herniation pit in the uh, femoral head neck junction. Um, it was described by a radiologist named Pitt, um, and he described that as occurring in 5% of the general population, which was, a, he said, an inclusion cyst or an intraosseous ganglion that was of no significance. But in all reality, you see it about a third of the time with FAI, and it's probably in reaction to the impingement itself. As I said, I like the intraarticular uh, contrast uh, because it improves the sensitivity of the labral tears, but more importantly, because you have such a high prevalence of asymptomatic labral tears, you wanna know if your pain is intraarticular or not. Um, MRR in general is not great for looking at chondral injuries. So just looking at the MRIs here, you can see that there's a labral chondral junction injury uh, of, of, on this MRI consistent with, it, with the FAI. Here you can see a chondral injury, not, not great, but you can still see that it's different than the cartilage around it. One thing to remember is that the, unlike the shoulder where the capsule inserts into the labrum and the labrum inserts into the bone, you have a cleft between the labrum and the capsule. The capsule inserts directly into the acetabulum. The labrum should move independently from the uh, um, capsule itself. And so this is a normal cleft, as you can see here. Um, Whereas there's your labral chondral junction injury. Uh, here's another labral uh, chondral junction injury. And then here's just some intrasubstance labral damage on this MRI. Now, one of the ways we measure impingement is doing what's called, uh, measuring so-called alpha angle, which was described by Notesley. Um, if so if you draw a line from the center of the femoral neck at its narrowest uh, area to the center of the femoral head, that's one line that makes up your angle. You determine the radius of the, uh, of the uh, head, um, and so align to, uh, to one edge of the sphere, and you follow that to where the femoral head goes outside of the sphere. And so that point to the center of the head is the second line. And so that, those two lines together give you your so-called alpha angle. And the alpha angle of less than 55 is considered uh, normal, greater than 55 is considered uh, consistent with impingement. So you can see how on this bottom one that the head goes outside of the sphere uh, quite early. And so that's your larger angle. One of the things I think is, can be helpful, particularly early on when, some, when you're uh, just starting to look at hips, getting a 3D CT scan because not all cam lesions are the same uh, in size or, or location or in breadth. So I think that the, the uh, 3D CT shows things better. Plus you can see on the bottom right, as an acetabular rim stress fracture non-union, and you can see how much how big that piece is uh, to, to determine if you removed it, would you make them unstable or dysplastic versus having to repair it. And then in some here's one for an unusual anatomy. This was a kid that had a slip capital femoral epiphysis um, that was delayed in diagnosis, got a single screw, it continued to slip, and he ended up with a with coxa uh, valga, I'm uh, coxa vera, no valga, sorry valga. And then he had a femoral neck osteotomy, but it still didn't bring him out of um, uh, didn't bring him out from his um, uh, uh, neck ferrous position and, and tried to bring him straight up. Uh, so he was still impinging before we uh, operated on him. Here you can see this is a person that had some significant lateral over coverage of his acetabulum uh, through here. That's his normal acetabulum up in, looking. We're looking from lateral, but that's all extra bone. Um, and then. Here you can see actually a low AIIS uh, in this patient. And, and you can get so, um, what's called subspinous impingement, either from a, a malunion from an avulsion, or this was a soccer player, 17 years old. You can see the AIS on his dominant leg versus non-dominant leg has a different morphology. 
Here you can see again the normal and the abnormal, the, the abnormal projecting further over and down. And so with follow through and kicking, he'd cause impingement. And so you, this is another kid that had an old avulsion. I, I say that that looks like an elephant tusk, but that's it, it, you know projecting way forward uh, and down and was causing impingement of the hip. Now, how to plan. We were talking a little bit about planning for the surgery. There's, there are some systems out there uh, for looking with collision software, using a CT scan. Now they're starting to use MRI. We're doing a study with it, but basically they can do the imaging and then with collision software, move the femoral head around and see where the impingement is coming from. And if it's from the, and they have plans for if you only remove from the acetabular side or only the femoral side, um, how much you may need to remove and where you need to remove it from. So when we were talking about uh, planning for surgery, we're actually doing an ISACOS study to look at whether or not it actually makes a difference, at least in experienced hands. So how do I treat these? Again, the bony anatomy doesn't cause pain. There's a lot of people that have asymptomatic anatomy of FAI. I think the pain is coming from the breakdown of the soft tissues. I think it's the bony anatomy that puts the soft tissues at risk, however, particularly the labrum and the, and the articular cartilage. So we see this more often, I think, in athletes because athletes re require activities that take their hips through the full range of motion. And with that anatomy of impingement, that puts them at risk of the tissues breaking down. So the treatment, I, I, you know, some people ask me, should they have surgery to prevent arthritis? And again, I don't know of an operation yet that prevents arthritis. Uh, but here, for instance, was a, a cadaver uh, hip that I was doing for a biomechanics study came from a 90 year old donor. You can see no arthritis. You can see a, a pretty significant cam lesion straight anteriorly. So I don't know an operation that prevents arthritis and I don't think we should operate on asymptomatic hips. So only if they have pain, I think, should they be treated. Now you look at the different treatments, the conservative treatment, uh, we talk about activity modification, reduce things that take their hips through the extremes of motion, like no squats and lunges. But for runners, that would mean to shorten their stride length. And I think that that would remove or affect their effectiveness. Um, and they may not be able to do their sport. It's kind of like for an ACL. If you say, well, how can you prevent ACL on a soccer player or a cricket player? You say, well, don't cut or pivot hard, but if they don't cut or pivot hard, then they may not actually be an effective athlete. You can try non steroidals, but these only temporarily relieve the symptoms. Um, and so some people early on were worried also that PT may increase the symptoms. They say, oh, well, you have a stiff hip. Let's force that range of motion to stretch it out, which I think could cause some impingement. When you look at the studies, there's two good studies, prospective randomized control trials, looking at uh, uh, surgery versus physical therapy that came out a year apart. Both were from UK. This one, the fashion group uh, looked at uh, 23 centers, 348 patients. Um, they looked at the scores, the IHOT scores at one year, and they found that if you had surgery, they turned, had seven points better versus physical therapy with a minimally clinically significant difference of being six. So that both groups did improve, but the surgery group improved better than the physical therapy group. Uh, and the same was done by a study group from Oxford, where they also looked at, at 222 patients, also similar age group. They used uh, eight, they looked at eight months, they used the Haas score instead. Again, both groups improved, but the surgery group improved more than the non-surgery group beyond the minimally clinically significant difference. So the goal of the surgery, you wanna address the labral and chondral pathology, but you wanna restore the femoral head neck offset. And if there's over coverage in the acetabulum, you wanna relieve that as well. And so for the labrum, you can do a partial labrectomy versus a repair, depending on the quality of the tissue. The camera section, you wanna restore the femoral head neck offset. You wanna remove some of the over coverage of the acetabulum. And for the chondral damage, for the most part, we do a debridement and possible uh, microfracture. So the way I do it is um, uh, just showing schematically with traction on, uh, I remove the rim of the acetabulum that's over covering and you change between your portals to be able to do an adequate job of the uh, uh, pincer resection. Then you take the traction off to relax the uh, capsule uh, and be able to work in the peripheral compartment and you can restore the femoral head and neck offset. Um, again, you can switch portals as you need to, to be able to access the different areas. Fortunately, the majority of the cam lesions are anterior and lateral, and um, <coughs> and your you know your important vessels are posteriorly, so that tends to not be an issue. When you look at the outcomes, Ben Nuachuku looked at a systematic review of the studies comparing open and arthroscopic FAI 
using total hip as an endpoint, similar outcomes between open and arthroscopic. There's hair SIP scores improved with both. The WHO scores improved as well. The only large, long follow-up, Stepacher, um, which was part of Gonz's group, looked at 10-year follow-up after open FAI surgery. They found that um, still some people had positive impingement sign, but overall clearly decreased um, from 98% uh, had it being a positive impingement sign pre-op to 38% at 10 years, 80% survivorship of the surgery, with the predictors of failure being old, fatter people or people with dysplasia uh, and posterior acetabular coverage of less than 34%. And then Kierkegaard looked at a, um, a time dependent, dependent improvement after a surgery and basically found that the clinically relevant improvements started about three, between three and six months, sports function between six months and a year, but there was a plateau so that people did improve compared to pre-op, but they weren't as good as somebody who was healthy and didn't have a hip problem before. When we looked at our series of elite athletes, these were college professional and Olympic athletes that was published. Um, 84% of females and 83% of males returned to sports at the same or higher level um, with 13% of the women and 9.5% of the men return to sports, but not necessarily at the same level. But it took eight months to return to, to their elite level of sport. So FAI is an important common cause of hip pain. It's associated with early arthritis and labral damage. They're the cam and pincer types, but majority of people have a combination. The treatment usually is surgical. Um, and it can be done effectively and safely, both arthroscopically and, and open. Still need more long-term follow-up, um, but the key is not just treating the impingement, you gotta treat the associated pathology and you can't just treat the, the associated pathology and not, treat the, and not treat the impingement because I think those results are not as good. There's a study coming out from Canada that's gonna show that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mark, for making a very, very difficult topic, very, very simple and attractive. This was like a bibliography of uh, FBI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mind Mark, blowing. Uh, can I just ask some questions? Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, I can talk. Is uh, FBI? It looks like is there? Uh, is it sports specific? One. Is it developmental? Two. And third, once you treat that uh, FBI. How many of them recur? So the first question is, is it sports specific? We see it more commonly in certain sports, no question. But I've pretty much treated almost every, somebody with the problem with, in almost every sport, including I even had an Olympic race walker. Uh, but basically it's people that take their hips through the extremes of motion. You don't see it as much in your, in your skiers. But what we really see it a lot, um, as I said, in American football, basketball, uh, even, and I see a lot in water polo and synchronized swimming, probably um, uh, greater than 90% in those sports. Um, uh, soccer, probably between 70 and 90%. Uh, and ice hockey, we see it also um, probably about um, uh, between 70 and 90%. But we see it. I have tennis players. I have. Um, I don't have any cricket players because we don't have much cricket around here. But um, but otherwise, we we do see it very frequently in almost most sports, especially sports that require running, because I think you're taking your hips through the extremes of motion. But there was a very very nice study done um, that was um, uh, looked at soccer players and found that basically you don't see it in people under the age of 12. But these two studies that they had done uh, in Europe, they, they looked at it at, these, at the individuals and, and youth soccer and found that as, they, as the kids in, by age group got older, the older age groups had more FAI, CAM FAI than the, younger, than the younger kids. And you could almost break it down that the younger kids had mild FAI, the ones that had it. And then the older kids had more severe FAI. Then they went back and looked at the same uh, same kids uh, four years, three, four years later, and there was a higher prevalence of FAI, more severe FAI, but it didn't change after they were skeletally mature. So it's probably the forces on the physis of the femur, that uh, the femoral head, that lead to um, CAM FAI. And if you look at where that offset is, it's at, at the physis laterally or anteriorly. So, <laughs> so I think that um, 
it is developmental based on the activities that you, that the kids are doing. I used to think it was the cutting pivoting activities, but we just finished a study here looking at our water polo players. 97% of our water polo players have FAI. And so um, I think that it's the rotational forces on the growth plate or potentially just um, within the acetabulum or possibly as they're taking it up to the extremes of motion, loading it on the acetabulum itself. Um, Dr. Millen, you're on mute. Dr. Saffron? Morphology of the hip. Yeah, Dr. Anta. What about the morphology, like the mm -hmm. offset, the, the head size, the, the cup? Is that any... Yeah, so, so um, the only... The, well, so the morphology of the hip, the head, it doesn't seem to affect the head size. What I do see, though, is there's a lot of patients that have borderline dysplasia that also have cam anatomy. And I think it's because the acetabulum is not constraining the head to keep the head size down. And so one of the things I've seen is people get, one of the biggest problems I see is people have borderline dysplasia, have a cam anatomy, somebody operates on their cam impingement, doesn't realize that they also have dysplasia, makes them unstable, and then they have a big problem, probably a bigger problem. So, but I don't think the femoral head size itself, it's an asymmetric a loss of offset um, for the most part of, of what we, we see. And then you had asked about whether or not it comes back, Dr. Antal. Oh, um, what's that? A recurrent, yeah. I've never yeah. seen, well, I was gonna say, um, in adults, no recurrence. I have had some recurrence of the anatomy in, um, in kids uh, that, ha that had open physis, um, but not commonly. I've had it happen twice. Um, and so I think they may have the capacity, you know, they're both, both the ones I had that had some recurrence were 12 year olds. They were 12 or 13 when I did them. And then they, they, they you know, then a couple of years later, they had some more appearance. We do say that the number one cause of failed FAI surgery is not removing enough bone or removing too much. But, um, you know, that I haven't really seen, but I have had some that clearly had had regrowth of bone but those tend to be in um, the, in kids with open physis. So, sure. yeah, Doctor Millen, you, Millen has some question. Millen, you're on mute still, Doctor Millen. You're on okay. mute, Doctor Millen. You are on mute. Huh? Now we can hear okay. you. Okay. Yeah. So I think it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk, and uh, it, it was really enlightening. What I understand from this is the primary uh, pathology is uh, osseous. It's in the bones. And then that gives rise to labral pathologies or chondrolabral injuries. If we assume that, then are there at-risk parameters which have been studied where you can screen the high school level athletes and warn them as to you can have a cam or a pincer type of impingement if you participate into extreme sports. And can there be any at-risk population which can be screened depending upon the basis of anatomy, which you can easily do by the x-rays, by the way of doing x-rays, which have excellently shown. So is there any registry like this or are we maintaining something of this kind? In, 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 in order to know the preventive program, maybe like you have uh, FIFA 11 for ACL injuries? Right, so the short answer is, I think you can screen kids actually pretty easily because the reality is um, there was a study done at the University of Utah looking at in, uh, hip range of motion in, and they were, they were looking at impingement in their athletes and they were imaging all the athletes. And basically, if you look at the literature, if you have limited hip internal rotation, whether or not you measured in flexion or in extension, um, that is a pretty good hallmark for identification. And particularly, even though everybody has different degrees of version and that sort of thing, when you look at the studies, if your hip internal rotation is probably 20 degrees or less, then you probably have the anatomy of FAI. Um, if you don't have arthritis, you know, or, or frozen hip. Um, but for kids, I think that that's probably a, a reasonable initial screening tool. So for, I do our physicals uh, for the Stanford athletes. And we have 960 Stanford athletes. If they have hip internal rotation of 20 degrees or less, I'm telling the, the, their strength and conditioning coach, I don't want them doing squats beyond 90 degrees. 
and I want to maintain good glute strength. The problem is they still may end up, you know, because of their sport, having to uh, uh, run, you know, fast and take their hips to the extremes of motion and, and that sort of thing. I think that um, they still may impinge with their, with their sporting activities. But, but I try to limit what's done in the weight room uh, to try to help lessen the risk of that being a problem. Whether or not it actually prevents anything down the road or whether or not it actually um, prevents arthritis or anything, I don't know. You know, one of the big problems was that people were saying that you should do certain, you know, that, that Don's in this group early on said, you know, there's three things about impingement. Impingement uh, leads to uh, uh, arthritis. Um, you should have surgery to prevent arthritis and that can only be done through a uh, surgical dislocation. Okay. So what I learned from that was they may not be, and, and I give Gans all the credit in the world for identifying impingement in the pathophysiology. But I, I learned that, you know, we, this is done more commonly arthroscopically now than open. So it can be done ar uh, arthroscopically. I, I have patients in, as I showed that cadaver that was from a 90 year old specimen that have the anatomy of impingement that have no hip pain. Early on when I started learning about impingement, I thought I was gonna be really smart I saw a guy came to my office. I saw the x-rays. He was 62 years old, no arthritis, big cam lesion. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be a smart guy and say, ah, how long have you had hip pain? He said, one week. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I was skiing last week. I dislocated my hip. They put it back in and they told me to follow up with an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, <laughs> so he had never had any hip pain before. So, um, Keep, you know, so I don't know that everybody has impingement gets symptoms. Certainly they don't always get arthritis. So I don't know that yet that we have an operation that prevents arthritis. And if we do, and it would make some sense, maybe if you can re relieve the impingement that you might prevent arthritis is identifying who those individuals are that might get arthritis. If you have the ability to intervene early with a kid, you know, who's doing a sport that might be an FAI, you know, where FAI might give them problems, that might be fine. But the problem is, you don't find out until they're well, well defined into what sport they're going to play, right? They're, because it's not going to be till they're 15 or so, 16, that you might really start to get some of those changes. So they may be in high school. And maybe if you have somebody who's in high school and he's a good basketball player to say, yeah, you may be tall, a good basketball player, but you might have problems with the hip. I think you should take up swimming. I'm not so sure that they'll be uh, too keen on that. So, so that, that's the problem is trying to identify people early on. And then the other part I didn't actually answer to Dr. Antal was that we don't know why the acetabulum develops the way the acetabulum develops. But I think a lot of the evidence does convince us that it is the sport related activities as to why the cam lesions occur. Mark, uh, there is uh, one question which always been asked. Uh, uh, why these um, hip liberal pathologies, maybe uh, FAI or some other kind of pathologies are not very common in the Asian population? Because if you see the number of hip arthroscopic surgery, which is done in Western world, Visa is the hip uh, arthroscopic surgery, which is done in Asian population. Imagine the Asia constitutes nearly half of the world's population, the India, China, rest part of the Asia. And this part of the world is not get, getting affected by this kind of disease, the FAI or hip pathology, the labral disease. Whereas the Western population, the incidence of this pathology is very, very high. Any, uh, any differentiating study has been done worldwide where they could found out the cause of reason why such such a bag, uh, big difference in the incidence? No, you know, and that's a great question because I don't know why. What, what I have seen, though, you know, I've spent a little bit of time looking at the Japanese literature and, you know, dysplasia is much more common in, in Japan than it is in the United States. And if you look at the average center edge angle uh, or so acetabular depth, in, in the United States and in the Western world, it's very different. It's, it's a good three, four degrees more than the average center edge angle in Japan. In fact, this average center edge angle in Japan actually, I think was closer to 22, which we, we consider 25 as cut off for, for dysplasia. So, you know, it may be if you have a shallower acetabulum, obviously it's harder to cause impingement of the femoral head neck junction against it. But the, one of the things that I found also particularly interesting was a study that was done um, in Japanese baseball, in the Japanese baseball leagues, their prevalence of FAI is almost the same as it is in American baseball. And so again, it may depend on the sporting activities that, are, that people are doing um, when they're growing up. 
uh, that might have something to do with it as well. But I, but nobody's actually, I mean, we, we note that it's very less frequently performed in, in, in Asia than it is in, in uh, the United States and in Western Europe. Clearly the United States and Western Europe, it's done, the vast majority of what's being done in the world is being done there. Um, but I, I don't know exactly why we see so, so few hip arthroscopy cases, um, especially for something like FAI in, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So. I think, Mark, uh, it's a cultural habit of sitting cross-legged and uh, squatting is maybe one of the reasons. Well, it's interesting you say that because, I, you know, I, I had thought that, but, you know, I, I think squatting, um, which is very common in, in Asia, is, is not, you know, I mean, you'd think that if somebody has the anatomy of impingement, then they would, <laughs> then they, that would cause pain. Maybe if you're doing it from a young age in squatting, that it doesn't allow bone to grow it, in that way. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's, I mean, it's an interesting thing, but I would think, you know, when I have patients, you know, there's a thing that's very popular in the United States called CrossFit. I don't know if you're familiar with this. CrossFit is a, a, a gym program where people go to the gym yeah. and exercise. And a lot yes, of what they're yes. doing is heavy squats, heavy squats, you know, heavy weighted squats, which has been really helpful for my practice. Uh, <laughs> I see a lot of patellofemoral pain and hip pain, particularly the hip pain from the, doing the deep squats. And so, you know, granted, they maybe already have that anatomy. It's also interesting, you know, that a lot of my practice earlier on was martial arts. Um, because again, in martial, you know, what I say is you don't see a lot of dancers um, with, and, and gymnasts with FAI, because if they're not doing the splits by the time they're 10 years old, they're probably not going to go anywhere and dance. And so in martial arts, they, a lot of times people pick it up older in life, at least in the United States, and they try to get them to do the splits. <laughs> and that's where I think they have problems. But you don't see a lot of dancers um, with FAI because, you know, and again, maybe it's because they were forcing their hips to get that motion early on. And because of that, it doesn't allow for the growth of bone or could be um, uh, adaptation. That it Forces. Adaptation at a young age uh, without force. But, but Mark, this could this could be a very good subject of research by Sakos. You know, the the, the uh, FAI incidence in Asian population versus the Western population because that could be a very big eye opener. Either we are sitting in a ice, we are just seeing a tip of an iceberg and it is going unnoticed, or it could be not at all, not not evident in the pathology uh, as a clinical pathology. There is yeah. one technical question which is asked on YouTube by uh, Dr. Gaurav. Uh, how do you do your arthrotomy uh, while doing the, the hip arthroscopy, especially in FAI? Do you use banana knife or use the radio frequency device or some other device? So I don't do capsulotomy. Um, so, it very, so I use a three-portal approach to look around the hip. And I can see everything. As you can see, I can see everything I need to um, when I do it. It's very popular for people to use a two portal approach and they join the anterior and anterolateral portals. But we showed in 2000, 2011, I published a paper, an anatomic study that shows that if you join your anterior and anterolateral portals with a banana knife or with the radio frequency probe, you're cutting the iliofemoral ligament. Yeah. Okay? And, and so that's the biggest, strongest ligament in the body. And so some of the patients I take care of who've had failed hip arthroscopy have the capsule didn't heal and has led to instability of the hip. Um, you know, so now, and that did change what a lot of people did when I published that study and I, and I would speak about it. Um, a lot of people, Mark Philippon and those guys started to repair their capsule. And so, um, and I was just in a debate on this and that when people do a T capsulotomy as well, they take the interportal capsulotomy and then they cut longitudinally down the femoral neck to get great visualization of the peripheral compartment. And it does give great visualization, but they're also cutting through the zona orbicularis. And the zona orbicularis is the main structure that prevents distraction stability. Uh, it give, provides you distraction stability. The iliofemoral ligament, again, gives you great anterior uh, stability and helps limit external rotation. And so, you know, they said, well, you know, they cut it and they sew it back together. Now, you know, Roshan, you're, you're a knee surgeon, right? Yeah, I do everything. You, you do PCL reconstruction? Yes, yes. yes. So, 
do you find it's easier to do a PCL reconstruction when somebody has got a ACL and PCL tear both? Do you find it's easier to do a PCL reconstruction with that or when the PC or the ACL is intact? Yeah, I find it very easy when there is both the ligaments which are gone. Right. So that so what you could potentially do with that logic of what people are doing with the capsulotomies, you could you could cut the ACL. Yeah. Do your PCL reconstruction and sew your ACL back up. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Good so analogy. We, yeah, <laughs> Wonderful John, analogy. <laughs> John Fagan has shown that sewing up the PCL doesn't work. We've learned that in the 70s. Okay. So, so for people to cut the cut the iliofemoral ligament and then sew it back up and say, it's look at time zero that functions fine. Yeah, time zero, but does it function fine a year from now? And what we don't really know is what we don't, you know, it might prevent dislocation. But is there excessive motion of the femoral head neck junction um, relative to the acetabulum? I mean, I'm sorry, there's excessive motion of the femoral head relative to the acetabulum. Will that cause shearing forces that might lead to premature arthritis or less stability? I, nobody knows. We, you know, it's hard to examine the hip joint um, in that way to that degree, but, but that's my concern. And so I don't know that cutting, but granted, 98% of people who do hip arthroscopy advanced hip arthroscopy are doing interportal capsulotomies or T capsulotomies. And then and a great majority of people are repairing when they're done, but I'm not so sure that that's as good as not touching that stuff to begin with. Doctor, but if you're doing a, a without doing capsulotomy, is it possible for you to visualize the anterior medial anterolateral properly? Yeah. In fact, I can see more, I can see anterolateral and I can see posterior lateral. So somebody, somebody corrected me. The way, I, the way I do my peripheral compartment work, particularly camera section, is I'll make a window in the capsule straight laterally. So they say, well, in, in all reality, I'm doing an interportal capsulotomy, just a different one. 60% of the hip capsule has thickenings, which are the ligaments of the hip. But that's, you know, the iliofemoral ligaments between the anterolateral and, post, and um, anterior portals. Yep. I'm going between the anterolateral portal and the posterolateral portal, straight laterally. There are no ligaments there. And so I'm making my window there. And with that, I can go over the front of the hip. I also take, have my fellow take the leg out and we rotate the, rotate the hip. I can get all around the hip very nicely and I can go to the back. People who just do the capsulotomy from the anterior and anterolateral, anterolateral and anterior portals can't go along the posterior lateral and posterior aspect of the hip, but I can get there because I'm going from straight lateral. So I can see the retinacular vessels and, and beyond that. Okay, I think we should move on to the next talk. Uh, Leo? Okay. okay. Yeah, Leo okay, Pondra? Yeah. yeah, Leo. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's good? Yes, yes, it's good. I'll just mute everyone. Okay. And we so can go ahead the last now. talk is about hip instability. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, it's gonna be talking about evaluation management of hip instability. And this is the quickest area, the newest area growing. And this is where I've been spending most of my research in the last uh, decade or so, specifically as it relates to hip arthroscopy, is identifying hip micro instability, which I think is a, is a real issue that um, is under recognized and is just has been gaining acceptance in the last few years. But when I first published I first published some research or presented at the ORS in 2008, showing that the femoral head moves relative to the acetabulum. And people said, you're crazy, it doesn't do that. I said, well, I may be crazy, but the data is the data. Um, the femoral head does move relative to the acetabulum. And they said, well, maybe because it was in cadavers, but subsequently since then, smarter people than I have shown that the femoral head does move relative to the acetabulum. And so, um, I'm, I'm not going to go on as much. I don't have the time to go into great detail. I, I could have given an hour talk on each of these things um, because uh, um, I think there's a lot more info. I was once taught the more you know about something, uh, the less it needs to be written. And so we know very little about a lot of this stuff. So that's why I keep talking. Um, but I published this uh, review uh, a year ago on micro instability and it talks a lot of the basic science about why I think uh, micro instability exists. But the question is, what is instability, right? We Shoulder, we got somebody who's got ligamentous laxity and all. When does it become instability? It's basically when you have symptomatic laxity. And the same is true in the hip. You have some people that are very loose jointed that have no symptoms, 
and there's some that are less loose jointed that have symptoms. And I think it's, it's symptomatic laxity. But unlike the shoulder, they don't complain of shoulder or of hip dislocations, but they do complain of pain. So I think hip micro instability is being more frequently recognized and more particularly as a cause of hip pain. So the key is, I think, to diagnosis. And I think the more you look for it, the more you end up seeing it. So I'm going to review the latest clinical and imaging clues, talk a little bit about the arthroscopic findings, and then about management. But I'm not talking about hip dislocations. I'm talking about the micro instability. So certainly one of the hallmarks early on for me was people who didn't have an injury, but they may have been diagnosed with something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or benign hypermobility syndrome. And even patients with dysplasia can have some hip instability. The key when I was first starting to look into this was that people had normal bony anatomy, but still were having pain. And, and again, we said 87% of people have either dysplasia or FAI as a source of their pain about their hip with labral tears. Where was that other 13%? I think that other 13% may be uh, at least a large percentage instability. So when we look at an examination of these individuals, again, they don't complain of instability. They tend to complain just of hip pain, very similar to anything else you might have with uh, any of labral tears uh, symptoms. So when we looked at Baton signs, do Baton signs correlate? They didn't seem to correlate with hip instability. We had some people with loose joints that didn't have uh, um, uh, uh, hip instability. But I do think that a lot of instability patients have um, ligamentous laxity. Uh, Mark Philippon talk, taught us about the so-called Faber test, which is um, basically in the figure four, you check the, the distance of the lateral joint line to the, uh, of the knee to the table. Um, but the problem is, you know, you make it an asymmetry like this, but the question is, is the right side loose and the left side, or is the left side tight? It's kind of hard to know. What I've generally used as a general rule of thumb is I've you try to measure from the lateral joint line to the table by fist, basically. And here you can see a girl that has about one and a half or so fist height from her left knee to the table, whereas on the right one, it was one fist. So she clearly had an asymmetry. But, and that, but that one fist height I found to be at least something that makes me bring my attention a little bit more that there might be some instability. Mark Philippon taught us about the so-called log roll test where you internally rotate, whoops, I'm gonna go back a second. You internally rotate the leg uh, and then let it drop out to see where it, where it falls and finds that if it's you know 60 or 75 degrees that that might be um, a sign of, uh, of instability. Here you can see this is that same girl. Her, her left foot external rotation is probably about 70 degrees, 75 degrees, but her right one's like at 90 degrees. So they're asymmetric. And that's the, the iliofemoral ligament limits external rotation in, uh, in extension. So uh, just the way they lay may, may be a clue if you see an asymmetry like that. So the better tests I like, this one was taught to me by Carlos Guanche. You flex the hip, I'm sorry, you, you abduct the hip about 30 degrees. You um, extend the hip, you externally rotate and put an anteriorly directed force on, on the hip itself, on the trochanter. If that causes pain anteriorly, that would be consistent with instability based on that test. When we, studied, um, when we studied these, uh, we found that the most accurate test that we have for assessing hip instability, the sensitivity was 81%, the specificity was 89%, and we published that in the, in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. Another test Ben Dome described is the hip is externally rotated while laying prone and you push on the greater trochanter again, pushing anteriorly, and that should cause pain anteriorly. We found that this is not very sensitive, but highly specific. So if they have this test, you can be very suspicious that they might have instability of the hip. And then the, one of the more common tests that's done is a so-called hyperextension external rotation test. So the patient's at the end of the table, the hip is hyperextended and you externally rotate. And if they cause pain anteriorly, again, that would be suggestive of instability. And th this one was 71% sensitive and 85% specific. And so you can imagine as you extend the hip, the femoral head comes forward, you externally rotate, the femoral head comes forward. So both of those are kind of a stress um, maneuver for assessing anterior instability. We found that if all three tests were positive, you had a 95% likelihood of having a diagnosis of instability intraoperatively. In all actuality, if two of those three tests were positive, you had a 92% likelihood of an intraoperative diagnosis of instability. Another test that I don't use, but it was taught to me by Steve Aoki is his so-called axial distraction test. With the patient's supine on the table, you have your knee at their ischial tuberosity, their hip is flexed about 30 degrees, slightly abducted, and he's applying an anteriorly directed force on the proximal tibia. 
and you could feel the femoral head shock or move within the uh, acetabulum. And then the last instability test we checked for is the so-called posterior apprehension test. Unfortunately, though, this also is, an, is the same maneuver as an impingement test, but with a posteriorly directed force. Um, so anterior pain, I think, is impingement, but posterior pain may be some instability. As far as radiographs, obviously, you want to look for dysplasia, center jingle less than 25 um, on the AP view. Um, uh, at, uh, you also want to look at the tonus angle, greater than 10 being uh, consistent with instability. Um, but there's some other signs that you can see. So you can have excessive femoral and acetabular antiversion. You can have, you can see a high anterior wall, coxa valga, narrow iliac wing, and a wide obturator foramen might be suggestive of somebody with uh, instability. We described the so-called cliff sign. And if you look here at this AP pelvis, this is a patient that has not had surgery, but their femoral head just instead of being a sphere drops straight down like a cliff. And we see this on both on the AP and lateral uh, x-ray, um, one or the other, not always both on, on the patients. Martin Beck seems to think this might come from the gluteus medius, but I don't think that the gluteus medius affects that far as much of the head, but it's a possibility. I don't know where it comes from. When we looked at the cliff sign and we published this, that we looked at people with instability um, in our group, 89% of those that had a cliff sign had instability, 27% of those without instability had a cliff sign. And I'm sorry, and here instability in patients with and without cliff sign. So 74% of patients with instability had a cliff sign, 7% without cliff sign. So a cliff sign, I think, is a, is a marker for it. And what we found in young women, all of them that had instability had a cliff sign, or all the ones that had a cliff sign had instability. And when we looked at the inter-observer reliability, we had 96 patients with three raters. We tried different ways to measure the cliff sign. That we didn't find very good. But basically, it's one of those things that when you see it, you know it or when you know it, yeah, and so it, it's there. Uh, Chris Larson talks about distal sclerosis on the femoral head neck junction, which I think may be coming from hypermobility impingement against the AIIS. Josh Harris described a so-called splits radiograph where he has the, uh, his people sitting upright in the splits position and their lower extremities externally rotated. And what he finds is that sometimes the greater trochanter uh, will um, uh, impinge against the posterior acetabular rim but he also showed femoral head subluxation as well as what he calls a vacuum sign. And so if you look here in another study that they did on uh, ballet dancers that were asymptomatic, you see here the subluxation and the so-called vacuum sign from the negative pressure in the joint. So they had 47 ballet dancers, 89% had femoral head subluxation, 36% had a vacuum sign. They found that those that had an increased alpha angle um, uh, tended to have more of the subluxation and men had more um, dysplasia. Um, the average subluxation was 1.4 millimeters in his, uh, in his patients. Looking at the MRI, John Saki and the group at the University of Michigan looked at a couple of things uh, on MRIs uh, on an axial oblique. Um, one, they looked at the space distal to the zone orbicularis. Uh, that's an anterior joint recess, they called it. Um, and he said if it was greater than five millimeters, um, in size that was consistent with uh, capsular laxity, or if the capsule in that area is less than three millimeters, that, that thinning was consistent with um, instability. But they, they injected as much fluid as they, the patients would tolerate into the hip joint. And so they, make, they gave a lot of fluid. We tend to give about 11 cc's of fluid. Um, and so uh, we didn't see, find that the anterior hip joint recess was as valuable because we're not forcing in the fluid. But we did look at capsular thickness, and this has just been accepted to the uh, Journal of Hip Preservation Surgery. But women who had laxity, 85% of them had a thickness of less than three millimeters. Women without laxity, almost half had thickness of less than three millimeters. So more frequently seen in those with instability. And when we looked at women, uh, when we looked at people that had less than three millimeters thickness, 82% of the women had the laxity. If the capsule was more than three millimeters thick, 40% had laxity. So not um, an all or none phenomenon, but certainly associated with uh, instability. Other clues, particularly in people who've had surgery, you'll see a capsular defect on the MRI. So MR arthrogram showing a capsular defect. And another clue is the ligamentum teres. And sometimes you need to get your radiologist to look at uh, and describe what's going on with the ligamentum teres because frequently they won't uh, comment on it on the MRI reports. Martin Beck described a so-called fear index where he looked at an angle between the acetabular inclination and the femoral head physeal scar. So the FE is the femoral epiphyseal scar. 
versus the uh, and ARs at tabular roof. So he looked at an angle and to see if they had um, instability or not. And he found a high ob inner observer reliability looking at the center edge angle and the anterior inclination. But basically he found that an angle of less than five degrees had a high probability of being considered stable. And so again, this is in borderline dysplastic patients. So basically he felt that 79% of those that had borderline dysplasia that had a fear index of less than five were more likely stable and treated just the CAM component. But if they had a fear index of greater than five, they're more likely to be unstable and he did a PAO. So if you had a painful hip with a center edge angle of less than 25 and a fear index of less than five, that um, he would uh, uh, not do a PAO. How, we went ahead um, and did the same thing looking at the so-called fear index uh, in all of my patients, those that had instability and those that did not have instability with and without dysplasia. So we wanted to just see our instability, people that had instability versus FAI. And we confirmed that the fear index though five degrees was not our, was not our critical threshold, that the fear index did seem to correlate with people with instability versus not having instability. So our treatment for instability patients, again, you have operative and non-operative. For the operative, uh, non-operative, we similar like we do with shoulder instability, we strengthen the periarticular musculature. So for the hip, it's the hip and the core and activity modification. We looked at 64 patients uh, that came to me with instability that we sent for rehab. 63 of those 64 were females. The one non-female was a professional male ballet dancer. Average age was 18 to 53. 70% of the patients had insidious onset and symptoms. They had their symptoms for almost two years on average. They had a uh, formal physical therapy and a home exercise program for six weeks that involved hip and core strengthening. And we did a follow-up of more than two years. On average, it actually was close to four years follow-up. And what we found was that 35% said they were markedly improved. 16% had partial improvement. Neither of these groups went on for surgery. 19% said they didn't really improve, but they didn't want surgery. It wasn't bad enough to need surgery. 30% actually ended up went surgery for capsular uh, plication. But when you looked at the athlete subgroup, half of the athletes ended up coming to surgery versus 27% of the non-athletes. So how do I manage these? If they have bony deficiency, if they have pretty significant um, uh, dysplasia, so center edge angle of less than 17 or tonus angle greater than 16, they'd get a PAO. If femoral inversion was a problem, we'd do a femoral osteotomy. For those with micro instability, if the capsule is intact, we'd do a plication. If you have a capsular defect, we would close the capsule. So my intraoperative confirmation though, so all that was pre-op, but intra intraoperative confirmation, it depends on your fracture table, but I find that less than 10 or 11 turns to get eight millimeters of joint distraction was consistent with instability. But sometimes what we would do is we'd put the patient on the table I'd use just gross body weight to get, make sure the perineum is down against the post as I was describing. And sometimes you'd already see a bit of an air arthrogram. You'd see this vacuum sign with just body weight traction. That's abnormal. And so that's something we see with the instability. But if it takes less than 10 turns to get the hip um, distracted, then um, that's another sign that we found. And we, as we went back and looked at who required instability surgery and who didn't, it seems to be 10 to 11 turns on our fracture table made a difference. But one of the things we also found was after we removed the uh, negative intraarticular pressure and tried to take the traction off the hip to prep and drape for the regular operation, it sometimes wouldn't reduce. So here's body weight, there's traction applied, removal of negative pressure, and then we took the traction off and you can see the hip is still subluxated. And so that's another potential sign of instability. The pathology in the joint, when you get the success of motion of the femoral head neck junction, uh, femoral head against the acetabulum, you get a labral control separation and then you get this inside out wear pattern of the acetabulum, or the acetabular articular cartilage. It's usually focal. It tends to be only a couple of millimeters of, of wear, but it's a wearing down. It's not the impingement type of damage. And so what we see on, on the acetabulum is that you'll see damage of the labral chondral junction, usually straight anteriorly at three o'clock uh, by the psoas U, and an, an inside out wearing pattern uh, at that same region. But you can also get it straight laterally. So this is a person that had a tonus angle of about 14. You can see the labrum actually looks intact. You're looking straight laterally. I'm looking from the posterior lateral portal. My probe's coming from the anterior lateral portal. But you can see that wearing down of the articular cartilage straight laterally at the labral chondral junction is consistent with um, uh, instability, lateral instability. You also on the femoral side can see some chondral damage on the central portion of the femoral head. Um, and you see ligamentum teres here on this MRI as well as you can see it arthroscopically. <clears throat> 
So the treatment, um, you, know, we, you could do it open. Here, early on, we did thermal capsulography. I think the hip was a little bit different than the shoulder because it's a thicker capsule. Um, and if you did just striping, I think it would be safe, but because of the concerns of thermal and, and destroying the capsule, just like we saw on the shoulder, we went on to plication. So this is Mark Philippon did the first report in 2001 of a thermal capsulography for instability. Didn't get much detail in the patients, but there was a handful of them, uh, but just said they did better with capsular tightening. Ben Dome published his study on borderline dysplasia. About a half of those patients also had cam resections. So it's a little bit tough to decide um, was it the, the uh, plication or the camera section that got the patients better? And then Chris Larson actually looked at Ehlers Demos patients, but 90 plus percent of his patients also had camera sections uh, in addition to the plication. But when you take all these series, all of them reported greater than 80% good to excellent results. I do a little bit of a different procedure, and this is how I access also my peripheral compartment a lot of the times. In blue is your iliofemoral ligament, in green is your ischiofemoral ligament. So I take out a part of the capsule. Um, between those two ligaments themselves. And that accesses the peripheral compartment to do my camera sections if I want to. And I found that if I close that up, that also ends up uh, basically plicating or tightening the capsule. I call this the so-called rich procedure because it's kind of like the rotator interval closure of the hip. So Roshan wanted some hip uh, shoulder talk. So here I talked about the rotator interval closure um, but of, of the hip. And we looked at 32 patients, all were women, average age was 27, that had no bony surgery, just capsular plications. A third of them had a center jingle less than 25, but almost half had a tonus angle greater than 10. So borderline dysplasia, depending on how you wanted to call it. They, a significant improvement, they all improved, not had a reoperation, none had increased symptoms, nobody had loss of motion. With the capsular plication that Ben Dome described, he had uh, an average uh, 10 degrees loss of external rotation, which if I did that in my dancers, they would lose their ability to dance. Um, but all the athletes, and a third of them were college or pro athletes, they returned to their sport, even in those with dysplasia. So in summary, I think hip microinstability is real. There's an increasing ability to diagnose these preoperatively by examination and plain radiographs. MRI is helpful as well. Dysplasia and annulus danlos syndrome are not the only causes of hip microinstability. I think you see these, particularly in sports that that encourage um, stretching the capsule and gaining range of motion. Um, but you can see this in a, in a lot of other sports as well, even traumatically. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that wonderful talk on uh, hip micro instability. You, I think you opened up a new chapter for absolutely. us. Absolutely. <laughs> we were absolutely not aware of this micro instability yeah. of hip. I heard you once uh, talking in this course meeting about the hip micro instability, but we never heard about this instability in so great detail. So thank you very much. I think we have a few questions yeah. from Mark. Uh, so Mark, this uh, micro instability is all to do with capsular laxity. Yes. What's that? This micro instability is to do with capsular laxity. Yeah, I, for the most part. I mean, I think you can have mild degrees of bony loss that can, I think, put more strain. I, I, I look at it as, you know, if there's excessive motion of the femoral head relative to the acetabulum, you're gonna strain the labrum. You might, you might cause damage to the labrum, may cause strain to the capsule. That leads to more laxity, leads to more labral damage, more capsular damage. And I think, but I think that this is mostly a, a, um, a, a capsular laxity issue, yes. Right. Major, majority of these gymnasts and majority of the sports which requires splits, all of these have a lax capacity, a capsule, capsular laxity to a great extent. So where do you draw the line between acceptable capsular laxity and instability? Symptoms, basically symptoms. It's a, it kind of what I was getting at earlier was that if you're a dancer or a gymnast, and yeah. if you're not doing the splits by the time you're 10, yeah. you're probably not going to go far in that sport. But there are two groups of people that can do the splits that they by the age of 10. Those that have some dysplasia or those that have capsular laxity. So you'll see some with normal, to totally normal uh, center jingle. And some I even have some that have a center jingle of 40 or 45 degrees, but they've never complained of stiff hips because they have the capsular laxity. Uh, uh, and then those that have dysplasia don't have to have as much uh, capsular laxity but I think they develop their capsular laxity by stretching. And, you know, it's the same thing. Dancers are always trying to get that extra turnout. 
Um, you know, their foot turned out. Um, and I think that stretches the iliofemoral ligament. And there comes a point, and that point is different for everybody, I think, um, where they have too much motion and then they become symptomatic. It's a, just like when I look at American baseball pitchers and probably your cricketers are probably similar. The more laxity they have in their shoulder, the harder they can throw the, throw the ball. But there comes a point where they have too much laxity, they become unstable, they become symptomatic, and then they can't throw the ball as hard. And I think the same thing in the, in the dancers and the gymnasts, more laxity is an advantage to a point. And then they become unstable. And then the instability, then that's when you, I think, have to operate on them. Where, where we still are very much at our infancy. And it's funny that at that first paper I published on instability uh, on our on our patients was because my, my fellow kept pushing me to saying, look, this, I understand this is real. You should publish this. This is important. And I said, well, I don't have a measure of how loose they are. I don't have a measure of how tight I've made them. I don't have a measure of how, you know, intraoperatively or postoperatively how tight I've made them. And he said, yeah, but you've got a, you've got a uh, validated outcomes questionnaire. And you know that if you only do labral surgery on patients, 60% will do well. And these patients do well across the board. And um, and, but I, so we wrote the paper up, we submitted it. It took four years to get it published and it took, um, and it got rejected by most every journal until I got smart enough to say to the editor, because they all said, this doesn't exist. You can't prove it to me. You don't have an objective measure. And then I, and then one day it just hit me. We have all these papers in shoulder instability and we don't have a measure of how loose the shoulder is or how tight we've made them intraoperatively or postoperatively. And so you know, how is this different from the shoulder? And when I posed that to the, et to the editor of KSSTA, he said, good point. Okay. And they accepted it. <laughs> Mark, one, one last question. Yeah. The, the, ones, well, the ones which have bony uh, the, the dis dysplasia, right? You, yep. you tighten the capsule for them too. And that if, takes away the pain? So if they have dysplasia, and, and, and so what I think of, if they have a center edge angle, that's less than 17 degrees, okay, or a tonus angle of greater than 16 degrees, I generally send them for a PAO because I just think that that biomechanical environment is just not good enough to be restrained by the capsule. And the question is, is, is that maybe even too conservative? Maybe I should be not operating on people down to 17 degrees. The way I started doing this, though, was when I had a patient – that had a center angle of 22 degrees, I sent them to my partner who does PAOs. And he says, that's not enough dysplasia to go through a big PAO. You could probably take care of this through the scope. And so then I'm like, then I was concerned. And so then I, when I took the cam, then I tightened, you know, then I closed the capsule and I found that they actually did well. Okay. And then it would creep down, creep down. Um, and then I did one patient with a center angle of like 17 or 18. And I said, you're going to need a PAO. She's like, look, I'm young. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I don't want to go through that operation now. And five years later, you know, she says, I'll get the PAO. And then five years later, she still hasn't had a PAO. Her hip still feels good. So, Brilliant. Um, yeah. so, you know, and we've seen five-year data now that actually it seems to hold up um, that, that the caps are, but again, I think in an biomechanical environment of a high, steep roof, or really shallow acetabulum, I just think they just probably just have the better biomechanical environment and get a PAO. Thank you very uh, much. Mark, Mark there, is, there is one question on YouTube. Question? Yeah, there is a one question on YouTube by Dr. Gaurav Gupta. Uh, how, uh, what are the tricks to prevent the uh, nerve injuries while doing a PL portal? Um, so the tricks for the uh, posterior lateral portal, is that you wanna make sure that the hip is a neutral flexion extension because if you flex the hip, you bring the sciatic nerve closer to the joint. Yeah. Also, you want the, the foot in neutral rotation. If you externally rotate, you bring the greater trochanter posteriorly. And so your angle is such that you get, as a needle gets closer to the joint, you're closer to the um, sciatic nerve. If you're internally rotated, you're moving the sciatic nerve closer to the joint. So you wanna make sure the foot's in neutral rotation and neutral flexion extension. And I think that that, um, you know, that generally makes it a safe, a safe situation for the uh, sciatic nerve. Yes, Dr. Anta, you had a question? Can I just ask you how you validate this capsular volume after you have tightened and how much you tighten? Uh, is there any uh, criteria with you? So, yeah, so that's, 
what I'll tell you is that on average, for my average patient, the capsular defect that I cause, the capsular window, if, uh, if you will, tends to be about 15 millimeters from anterior to posterior and about uh, six to eight millimeters from proximal to distal. So it's an oval, um, kind of like the, show, the drawing showed. Um, the, uh, I tend to be even closer to eight or even sometimes a little bit more than that for people that are really loose jointed. Um, we actually have spent, it, it, it spent a long time developing a model of instability, cadaver model of instability, which we published um, last year, two papers, one showing that we could develop a model of instability of the hip um, without cutting the capsule, without, um, uh, without cutting the ligaments. We basically developed a model of stretching the ligaments and showed that we can change and measure femoral head translation relative to the acetabulum by stretching. Um, and then we just published uh, later last year, um, what happened, you know, what is the relative contribution of the labrum and the capsular ligaments to uh, the stability of the hip. Um, but that was all in preparation for trying to identify what is the best way to placate uh, the hip capsule. You know, I think just taking a hip capsule, cutting it and placating it where you have normal hip capsule is not, not really representative of the, uh, of, of the pathologic problem. And I think, uh, you know, there's a nice study that was done by Phil Noble where they actually were pie crusting the ligaments uh, to show that, you know, you can maintain the ligament integrity, but by pie crusting it, you can cause excessive femoral head motion relative to the acetabulum, which I think is good, but it's again, not physiologic. So we, we were able to cause the, the ligamentous laxity, if you will, by stretching the ligaments. And we developed a protocol for that. Both articles are uh, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And, um, but their next phase, which we were supposed to have actually gotten into um, uh, when the coronavirus hit, we've done a couple of cadavers only. Um, but the problem we've been doing is that we're also using cadavers that are under the age of 45. Um, because, uh, that, again, that's more like the group that we're going to, you know, that we're operating on and that allows us to be able to stretch the capsule better. So, um, I, hopefully I'll be able to get back to you to prove that we are affecting the volume of the, uh, of the joint. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Really Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Really uh, Mark Safran. That is a wonderful, uh, session by you. And uh, today we had a today is a bad day because we have lost one of our founder member of Indian Arthroscopy Society. Just oh, to inform sorry. you, there is a there is a, a big surgeon, Dr. L. N. Vora. So I'll request Dr. Nicholas Santau to say a few words about it. I mean, well, I'll just share my uh, laptop so that I can show you the photograph of Dr. L. N. Vora. So can all of you see his photograph? No. 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 Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. Part of yeah. it. Yes. Now we can yeah. see in photo. So, yeah. So so this was Dr. Ellen Vora, who was a founder treasurer of uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society way back in 1983. Very sen very senior professor from my institute, K. M. King Edward Memorial Hospital. Very be beloved teacher and a very uh, sharp-minded person, and uh, he has a uh, one thing which is very uh, good about him, he has a big memory. So uh, uh, this is the word from you. Uh, Dr. Antao, can you speak about Dr. Ellen Vora now? Oh, it's, uh, I was his registrar ah. for, for, for two years. And uh, he was a big, big disciplinarian. And uh, the amount of discipline he put into me and into us is a mark of uh, his astute clinical sense that from far he could make out said something wrong just mm. only on inspection. Mm. <clears throat> and this qualities of clinical examination he imbibed into us, which uh, we still carry forward as a memory of his uh, uh, teaching us in depth. <clears throat> he will always be remembered for the time of uh, teacher that he was, uh, went to the depth 
and uh, he was always a kind man at heart and uh, saw that everybody is comfortable, though at times things were not okay. Uh, but we always felt that Monday was a day of terror. The round, <laughs> the big round was... What round? Yeah. And we always, uh, what should I say, uh, you know, uh, we were uncomfortable in our pants. Uh, anyway, may his soul rest in peace. Yeah, yeah. So, so Sean, may, may, doctor, may, may, may his uh, soul, rest, soul in peace. rest in peace. And I think we all must thank Dr. Mark Safran for his wonderful time. Dr. Mark, this has created a tremendous impact on us. I think uh, we we'll have more from and tomorrow. More. I'll start looking for instability. Instability. Yes. <laughs> And Mark, of us will Mark, have more I and will, more understanding. Motion now to look uh, into hip arthroscopy in greater interest with yes. inspiration from your lecture. Yes, and constantly yes. try to collaborate with you to learn more and more of this. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Namaste. you. Yeah. Thank my honor. Maybe, maybe what you'll see. Maybe what yes. you'll see in India is not so much impingement, but maybe more instability. Absolutely. Yeah, sure, yes. Sure. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. You you, Thank you 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 have given us a new diagnosis and new disease now. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll try to explore it. <laughs> exactly. Thank, Thank you, you very Mark. much. Bye bye. Bye Mark. Very Thank honored. You. Thank you very much for inviting Thank me. You. Bye bye Mark. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thanks Roshan. Thanks. Bye.